Business Committee. Well, good morning, good people, and thank goodness for coffee. Uh, it is wonderful to be here with all of you again this morning as we celebrate some extraordinary leaders here in our community. This month uh, recognizes the importance of public health and specifically National Public Health Week. About two weeks ago, uh, it was announced that once again, Montgomery County was one of the healthiest counties in the state of Maryland and one of the healthiest counties in the entire United States of America. And although they no longer do rankings officially, we're number one. So, <laughs> um, and we are number one, quite frankly, because of the extraordinarily public health infrastructure that we have here in our community. The synergy between our public, private, and nonprofit sectors is critical to ensuring the health of our public. And let's be honest, there is nothing more important than the health of our public. It takes all of us supporting each other, but especially our public health professionals who dedicate their lives every day to making sure all of us are healthy, and especially our most vulnerable populations. This was never more important, as we know, and we will never forget during COVID, when our public health officials risk their own lives every day to be able to administer health to all of us, but also were the subject of threats on social media that were nasty and awful and frankly scary. But despite all of that, we have overcome these challenges and are now in a position that I believe we can build off of. And we recognize that somebody's health in Poolsville should matter to somebody who lives in Wheaton. Somebody's health in Bethesda should matter to somebody who lives in Germantown and vice versa. So we must continue to move forward. We must continue to invest. We must continue to recruit the best and brightest into this extraordinarily important field. Joining me today are some extraordinary individuals, several of which you will hear from soon. But we, all, we have our incredible public health team from the Department of Health and Human Services led by Dr. James Bridgers, Dr. Keisha Davis, Dr. Nina Ashford, Dr. Chris Rogers, and Mr. Sean O'Donnell. We also have public health partners and leaders here. Ms. Anise Cody from the Holy Cross Hospital in Nexus, Montgomery. And I was born at Holy Cross Hospital, class of 1976. Uh, Dr. Elliott is here from the Mary Center, who is their CEO. We also have representatives from our minority health initiatives who are extraordinary partners in building bridges in our community every day to reach populations that the government cannot reach on its own. We have Ms. Pat, Dr. Pat Grant here from the African American Health Program, Ms. Hina Meta from the Asian American Health Initiative, and we also have representatives from the Latino Health Initiative, uh, Ms. Patricia Rios and Ms. Marcela Campoli. And shout out to the African American Health Program who celebrated the anniversary of their wonderful health day that they did in Germantown just this past weekend. Another very successful event and another wonderful example of the importance of providing health directly in our community. We also have from our Commission on Health, uh, Ms. Gabriela Limos, and from the Department of Environmental Protection, Mr. John Monger, because we recognize that public health in all policies is what we need to ensure that we administer moving forward. And our environmental health is very critical to all of us. We also have representatives from Montgomery Cares Health Clinic Leadership, Mr. Mark Forker from Mercy Health, Kate Liu from the Pan uh, Asian Volunteer Clinic, and Mr. Peter Lowett from Mobile Med. I see these folks in meetings all the time. Uh, I see them on weekends and evenings and holidays, and I am so proud to stand alongside them this morning. We will now hear from two important speakers from our Department of Health and Human Services, and we will start with Ms. Dr. Keisha Davis, the, our County Health Officer. Dr. Davis. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Happy National Public Health Week. We are 
Um, so excited to be here. Thank you for the recognition. I want to thank again the team, the public health team, and also recognize Kenny Welsh, who is our senior administrator for licensing and regulatory services. Public health serves in the background to make sure that we are creating healthier communities for all. Montgomery County gets to have that distinction of being the healthiest in the state and one of the healthiest in the county, in the country, because of the work of public health officials working behind the scenes. We are data scientists, our epidemiologists who are running the numbers to know where the pockets of, of health disparities exist. Our licensing and regulatory team who is making sure that our food is safe to eat, our water is safe to drink, and our pools are safe to swim in our uh, disease and epi team who is protecting us from infectious diseases like rabies and TB and mpox and COVID. Our community health uh, team who is conducting the community health needs assessment and putting the mobile health van into communities who need more access to health care. Our maternal and child health team who is making sure that we have more healthy moms and more babies seeing their first birthday. So we are here, we thank you for the recognition and we thank the community for their involvement in helping to make this one of the healthiest communities in the country. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Davis. And on a cold rainy day in November, Dr. Elliott, the CEO of the Mary Center and I were passing out turkeys uh, to families in our community. And I had the opportunity to really speak to him and really get to know him through that process. He's a shining example of somebody we are fortunate that could be doing anything, uh, but has chosen this field and to support our community. And the Mary Center is also a shining example of the health clinics that we have in our community who are such strong partners and expand the reach of our public health infrastructure. Dr. Elliott. Thank you, Councilmember Albanos, and thank you, everybody, and, and definitely thank you to the colleagues and for everybody here today. You know, we have this privilege in National Public Health Week to recognize that health is more than just the, the clinical that we talk about every day. Um, but it's important for me, just from the clinical side, to expand to you what it means to be a day in the life of a person that comes to a public health center. So when you think about pregnancy and maternal health, you think about what happens during the pandemic. So, for example, Mary Center, we had up to 80% of women at one of our sites had no health insurance. They couldn't go anywhere. So it was absolutely imperative that we were there, we were available. And in many situations, we never shut our doors, just like the members up here on this community. We never closed our doors. We were always present. And we had over like 250 women who had COVID that had to come to us during pregnancy because there was nowhere else to go. So these kind of impacts in terms of public health matter. It makes a difference. And when you think of public health, it's not just the clinical. They come and they encounter uh, a patient care navigator. They encounter a family support worker. Are there any housing needs? Are there any community needs? Are there any issues whatsoever going on in your daily life that need to be made, uh, need to be addressed and accounted for and plugged in and collaborative with the county and other partners to make sure that we can support the community because the health in the community also impacts our economy. So it is absolutely imperative that as we recognize National Public Health Week, we also recognize the massive impact it has on not just the individuals that come to our sites, but also on the entire community as a whole. So thank you. Well, well said. Public health should not be a political issue, but it will be once again as we go through the national rhetoric of this presidential election cycle. But let's hold the line and continue to plant the flag here in Montgomery County, recognizing the importance of public health, not just this week, but every week. So I will now read the proclamation. Montgomery County Council uh, proclamation, whereas the theme for National Public Health Week 2024 is protecting, connecting, and thriving. We are all public health, and the goal is to improve the health of all people and achieve health equity. And whereas, Montgomery County continually ranks as one of the healthiest communities in Maryland and in the United States. And whereas, the annual rankings report highlights the benefits of healthy behaviors, access to health care, high rates of physical activity, and social connectedness as protective factors in our community. And whereas, in 2023, Healthy Montgomery Community Health Needs Assessment, a multi-year initiative aimed at shaping local health policies, directing health care planning, allocating resources, and facilitating collaboration across county government, community organizations, and health providers identifies vital health needs that will improve 
health outcomes disparities and equity, and whereas the CHNA identified overall mental health as the most important health issue access to uh, the most important health issue. Access to insurance as the most important social and environmental factor, and eating habits, low crime rates, and safe neighborhoods as the most important factors making us a healthy community. And whereas, when we all join together to address complex public health challenges across multiple sectors, we are ensuring a holistic approach to public health, addressing various determinants of health, and promoting health equity for everyone. Now, therefore, it be resolved that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby proclaims April 1st to the 7th, 2024, as National Public Health Week. And be it further resolved that the County Council expresses gratitude to our public health workforce for their collective actions and commitment to ongoing collaboration and investment in the public health of all Montgomery County residents. Presented on this ninth day of April in the year 2024, signed by myself and our Council President, Council President Friedson. Thank you all again. Happy National Public Health Week. Thank you to all of our public health officials. We are now going to move on to our second proclamation this morning, celebrating and acknowledging Fenley Skirlock and Jason Liao by Councilmember Bus. Don't be shy. You, you have not been shy in the writing of your book, and so you shall not be shy this morning either. Uh, it brings me great pleasure to uh, introduce everybody to two of our uh, rising stars here in Montgomery County, two uh, individuals who have taken uh, four years to write a book. And it's not any old book. It is a book that has been published by Random House, which is uh, an esteemed feat of its own, recognizing that uh, a very small number of authors are picked up by such uh, a major publishing house. And so who are those individuals? Uh, we have Jason Scarlock, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Jason Liao, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, and Fenley Scarlock. Uh, and what they have done is written a book down to business. And through the course of their uh, inquisitive youth, they asked themselves about uh, young people and about the secrets of success and what people have to do to reach the upper echelons of 
business leadership. And they spoke to 51 or more. And more. Yeah. How, how many people did you speak to? Over 60. Over 60. Over 65 individuals, they only picked the best 51 uh, to be in the book. But, but those luminaries, those business leaders whom they spoke with, are leading Masterclass, Hallmark, Ikea. Uh, I think we've all heard of them. Uh, and they gave their time to talk to these two uh, young men about the secrets of success. And it is absolutely awesome. Uh, I am so excited for you. I'm excited for your families as well. Uh, hi, Mom. Uh, uh, and, you know, I, I, I know that the uh, basis of these questions and, and your inquisitive nature definitely has come from your family. And certainly, uh, Kim Abbott and I, who, who work together at CNN, know something or two about asking questions. And so the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, clearly. But th this, this is just really impressive. And, um, you know, I will stop talking because I want to hear from you all uh, about the insights that you've heard from the book, and then we can, we can celebrate, okay? Here, come on up. Here, Finley. I wanted to, I wanted to start by thanking... There you go. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I wanted to start by thanking Councilmember Glass and the Montgomery County Council as a whole for this opportunity. We're so grateful to be here today. I also wanted to read a small passage from Down to Business, introducing the book's premise and mission. We are part of one of the most entrepreneurial generations ever. We are also a generation questioning everything and thinking outside the box to find solutions that will revolutionize the way we live. But while we have big dreams and drive, we still need to learn some core fundamental skills before we start launching real companies. Unfortunately, business and entrepreneurship aren't taught in most middle and high schools. And although camps, mentorship programs, and extracurricular activities are cropping up in many places, they are still out of reach for most kids. To try to fill that critical knowledge gap, we decided, we decided to gather some very expert advice. We wanted to know, what does it really mean to be an entrepreneur, and what does it take to get there? What can we learn from those who came before us, and from those who are doing it right now? How do we get up to speed fast and meld their experience with our ambitions, ideas, and instinct? That's what we are set on understanding. We wrote down to business as the guide map we wish that we had starting out, and we hope that young aspiring entrepreneurs like ourselves will see themselves in the people we interviewed, and through their stories, develop the skills they need to succeed. Whether in business or in life, we believe that an entrepreneurial mindset is a fundamental part of everyone's education, and employers do too, ranking it as the number one thing they look for in employees. But most of all, we believe that entrepreneurship can be a force for good in the world. And while our generation undoubtedly has huge problems to solve, we believe that entrepreneurship can bring us the solutions. The solutions. With that in mind, I encourage members of Gen Z and Gen Alpha to start early and never give up on their passion to succeed with, within entrepreneurship or otherwise. You can do it. That's great. All right, yes, and I'd like to echo Finn's amazing kind of thank you to all the council members and especially Council Member Glass for this amazing opportunity. Um, and I'd also like to pick up on a little portion of a reading. We interviewed leaders from diverse fields and industries, indie beauty experts, ice cream makers, bankers, brand experts, military vets, media moguls. They are both from small startups to big corporations, and they live all over the world, from Silicon Valley to Washington, DC, Beijing to Boulder, Australia to Ireland. We talked to leaders who went to Ivy Leagues and others who dropped out. We talked to some who were raised in public housing and others that were raised in privilege. Others who were immigrants who chased the American dream, and many who simply dreamed big. We talked to people across four generations, including some young entrepreneurs who were younger than us at the time, who are blazing the way for us and eager to share what they've learned. Our generation has big problems to solve, from closing the wage gap and leveling out the cost of college to saving the planet and protecting our data. Not only do we want to start now, we have to. 
This book is a roadmap to help prepare us, help us develop our entrepreneurial potential, and help us quickly bring the world the next generation of great products, services, and ideas. In doing so, we'll be able to make our mark in a world turned upside down and yet still full of possibility. Now, i just like to say very quickly, um, this proclamation is more than, I think, just a recognition to our work here today, but is kind of a testament to the work that Montgomery County puts in for young dreamers and doers. So as we honor kind of our work, I think it's important to recognize that we also have a huge responsibility in giving back to this community that has given us so much. Um, so I, I think one thing that we really wanted readers to take away is to dream big. So that's why we're dreaming big too, as we're hoping and we're working to get down to business into the hands of every student. And it's not just about learning entrepreneurship, it's about inspiring them and igniting a fire so that they can see beyond some of the conventional paths out there. So once again, thank you so much. And um, just to close it off, I'd like to say you know, thank you again. And it really, we really appreciate all your work in well, recognizing Montgomery County Youth. Well, Jason uh, and Fenley, you are welcome to come back and give inspirational um, testimonials every, every Tuesday here. Um, you, you're absolutely right that this is not only a testament of the work that you two have done, it is a testament of the community we have built where we welcome people from around the world, we welcome entrepreneurs, we welcome dreamers, uh, we welcome big thinkers. Uh, and it's timely that we're having this conversation today because we are in the middle of uh, deliberations for our 7.1 billion dollar budget uh, and we want to make sure that uh, you all uh, and all of our students uh, continue getting the best education possible so we can continue uh, continue the success so with that let me read the proclamation Come on up. the Montgomery County Council proclamation whereas children born between 1997 and 2012 collectively known as Gen Z are facing complex problems as they become young adults. And solving these problems will require entrepreneurial skills, including critical thinking, effective leadership, and creativity. And whereas an entrepreneurial mindset is consistently listed as one of the most important skills employers look for in new hires, but programs that teach entrepreneurship are not always available to many students. And whereas in order to bridge the gap, Fenley Skurlock and Jason Liao spent four years writing a book about entrepreneurship for Gen Z, in which they interviewed CEOs across sectors and leaders from around the world, compiling insight and advice for their generation. And whereas their book titled Down to Business, 51 Industry Leaders Share Practical Advice on How to Become a Young, young Entrepreneur, has been published by Penguin Random House, a milestone achievement by only one or two percent of all authors. And whereas Mr. Scurlock and Mr. Liao have demonstrated hard work, dedication, tenacity, and other attribu attributes of entrepreneurship through this project, and created opportunities for fellow members of their generation to learn these skills. Now, therefore, it be resolved that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby honors Fenley Scurlock and Jason Liao for their entrepreneurial spirit on the occasion of the official release of Down to Business, 51 industry leaders share practical advice on how to become a young entrepreneur, signed on this day, April 9th, by myself and council president. Congratulations, guys. And, and colleagues, if you want to come on down, because they've brought some gifts for us, we have our reading assignment for the next few days.
Here. <laughs> we have just a whole table of activity. I'm just move this around. Oh, hi. <laughs> I know. Where have you been? Oh, my dad. Where are you? dad is sick. Oh, no. I'm sorry.
Okay, we are going to move on to general business. Madam Clerk, are there any announcements? Good morning. Yes, I'm sorry. Good morning. There will be a public hearing for Bill 724, Landlord-Tenant Relations, Tenant Protection and Notification, on April 23rd, 2024 at 1.30 p.m. here in the Council Office Building. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. The minutes from the January 19th Tacoma Park Minor Master Plan Amendment uh, Tour and March 18, 2024 have been circulated. To colleagues, are there any objections to approving these minutes? Seeing none, the minutes stand approved. Agenda item number one, uh, we're going to have a discussion on the operating budget and have an overview with council staff and with the executive branch. Let me turn it over to Ms. Michelson and Mr. Howard, and you can take us through the packet. Great. Um, good morning, council members. I want to start out by thanking um, the staff that helped pull this overview memo together. Um, Aaron Tromka, who always provides amazing assistance for us on compensation issues. Uh, Selena Mendy Singleton for the section on racial equity and social justice. Bilal Ali and Logan Ambinder, who helped with various sections. But um, mostly I want to recognize and thank Craig Howard who um, is our lead on the operating budget and every year does an amazing job um, guiding our analyst and pulling all of our analysis together. And although um, several of us wrote different pieces of this, he's the one that pulls it all together and in fact does a major part of the writing. There is no one I know who can take such complicated information and boil it down to a memo of this quality um, and provide all of the information that the council needs, both in incredible charts and text. Um, and it's just a pleasure always to read anything that Craig has written. Um, so with that, um, first, uh, just kind of an overview of what we'll be covering today. Um, we're going to give you some of the context and background. We're going to take you through the key recommendations in the budget, revenues, expenditures, changes in compensation. Um, talk a little bit about the approach to racial equity and social justice, adherence to our fiscal policies, and the council president's recommended approach to the FY25 operating budget. And we'll end with some key decision points um, that the council may want to consider, whether you want to make any um, decisions today. So um, the FY25 budget, as you know, grows $7.1 million. And we have a background here of a na national economy that appears to be very strong, doing well, but where there are always uh, or there are mixed signals this year in particular. And each year before we write this memo, we try and look at what's happening in the national economy. And even in the last few weeks, um, there's good news. It appears that interest rates are going down. Wait a minute, not so fast. Maybe not in June. We don't know exactly when it's going to happen. And so. Um, we are optimistic about the economy, but the timing is really unclear, um, including what may happen later in FY25 and FY26. And for these reasons, um, we think that uh, we need to be cautious. Um, we look at our surrounding jurisdictions, and several of them are um, in a very difficult situation this year. Um, in PG County, uh, they've had only a 1% growth, uh, growth in revenues. Um, and my counterpart there has shared with me that it, they've already been going through a very difficult exercise of massive reductions uh, because 1% does not even cover negotiated contracts. Um, we've also seen that in Fairfax County and Washington, D.C., there are um, projected uh, reductions and increases in revenue sources. And you know, that gives us reason also to be cautious about what we may be facing going ahead. So um, as we looked at the budget, we have some key concerns that we're going to be talking about in more detail as we go through this uh, memo. Um, perhaps uh, the top one and the most important one is the use of reserves to fund ongoing operating programs. This is not only contrary to the Council's fiscal policy, but sets, sets us up for a structural deficit, which is really probably one of our main themes here um, that we're going to keep talking about today. 
Um, there has been a significant increase in tax supported expenditures in county government. Um, just in FY25, county government tax supported expenditures rose by close to 10 percent. Um, the funding for the school system goes $132.8 million over MOE. And given the projections of increase in enrollment, that already has a, um, a large impact on FY26 expenditures as well. And um, as we noted the, in our memo, and you'll hear more about the details, um, the budget with the current costs would, be, would provide a structural deficit of approximately $115 million in FY26, and that is before thinking about new FY26 compensation increases. And why does this matter? Um, well, in a year in which our reserves are really healthy, um, and we have reserves from, to draw from, a st structural deficit is not as great a problem in a year in which revenues are exactly as projected or less than projected. When that happens, the only options will be either savings plan or a tax increase. And so we want to make sure the council is cautious as you consider this issue of the structural deficit. And I'll turn it over to Craig. Thank you. And Glad that there's no pressure on my section now. Um, so we'll start by reviewing the tax-supported revenues in FY25 with this chart, which shows the percent change in tax-supported revenues going all the way back to FY02. The chart shows that since the Great Recession, the county has experienced relatively moderate revenue growth um, until the much more higher increases in FY23 through FY25. The red bar shows the estimated FY25 revenue growth of 5.8%. And for context, the yellow bars in FY17 and FY24 represent years where revenue grew in part due to tax increases. As the graph does show, however, the projected growth rate from FY26 through FY30 is much lower at 2.6%. And this is reflective of the mild recession scenario projected by finance and discussed as part of the December fiscal update included in the revenue estimating group reports that the Council has received. This next slide breaks down where the revenue increases came from in FY25. The 5.8% increase represents about $338.5 million um, in additional revenue in FY25 over the FY24 approved levels. The majority of this comes from property tax growth and income tax growth, um, with some reductions in recordation and transfer taxes that you've heard about before and we'll talk about um, in a minute. Um, and also there's some increases in uh, intergovernmental aid, um, which typically is, is state aid to um, MCPS as well as some other, um, some other programs and services. So this slide provides a bit more detail on the increases um, or the changes in the ta in three key tax revenues. Uh, the projected property tax revenue increases uh, represent 8.5% in FY25, and this is primarily due to increases in the assessable base. Um, and then increases in the out years uh, for property taxes are estimated at 2.6% per year. The executive does recommend continuing the income tax offset credit at $692 this year. Income tax revenues uh, are projected to grow by 6.5%, followed by 4.0% growth in the out years from 26 through 30. Income taxes continue to be one of the most variable revenue sources for the county, with total receipts from FY22 through FY24 exceeding estimates by over $400 million. And this is the source of a lot of the additional revenue that the county has seen and has bolstered reserves. And then on the other side, you have recordation and transfer taxes, which are both down substantially, uh, both in FY24 collections, which is an, a reduction of $41.2 million from the previous estimates, and then the FY25 projection is a reduction of $35 million, or 20% 20, 20 below FY24 approved levels. Turning now to expenditures that the executive recommends based on the, the revenues that are included in the fiscal plan. Overall, the executive recommends a tax-supported increase of $348.7 million, or 5.9% across all agencies, with county government receiving the highest increase of 9.9%, MCPS a 4.1% increase, the college a 1% increase, park and planning 6.1%, and then, of course, our good friend debt service at 3.2%. 
This next slide provides a little bit more detail on what some of the key building blocks are uh, that make up the expenditure increases recommended for FY25. For county government, just over half, about $105 million of the $199 million increase is from compensation and personnel cost increases. And you can see the various components here. They include annualization of last year's compensation adjustments, proposed FY25 compensation adjustments, um, FY25 retirement and group insurance cost increases, um, and those all together reflect about $105 million. And then the other uh, big chunk of increases for county government is proposed additions, enhancements, and new positions, which is about $95 million. For MCPS, the biggest component of the increase is the $106.9 million increase in the local contribution. And within the Board of, Education re Board of Education's request, key building blocks of their budget include uh, $79.5 million for compensation and benefit increases, $41.8 million for their employee benefit fund, and $53 million for enhancements and to replace federal ESSER funding. This slide looks at changes in the workforce, showing the changes in the tax-supported FTEs or full-time equivalent uh, positions over the past two years by agency. The net increase is just over 1,100, just under, sorry, 1,100 FTEs or 3.2% across the agencies. In county government, this is a net increase of 155 tax-supported FTEs in FY25 and 390 over the past two years. There does remain a relatively high number of vacancies in county government, which is currently about 1,000 vacancies in tax-supported positions. This is a decrease of about 200 uh, compared to this time last year. And based on the vacancy rate and the departmental hiring trends, as well as the discussions that both the executive and the council had last year, um, the Office of Management and Budget did a comprehensive review of laps assumed in the budget. And as a result, the executive's FY25 recommendation assumes a similar amount of total laps as approved by the council last year. There's a net change of about $2.8 million. Um, although how the laps is distributing, distributed amongst departments varies um, compared to last year based on the analysis done by OMB. Uh, both the county government and MCPS have completed contracts with employee bargaining units that include proposed pay, pay adjustments, which are uh, summarized on this slide. For county government, the executive's budget includes uh, pay adjustments of up to 7% or 8% for uh, general wage adjustments and service increments, depending on the employee group. For MCPS, the pay adjustments recommended by the board include fixed dollar amount increases for MCEA members, so the actual percent um, uh, will vary based on an employee's salary, as well as service increments for all employee groups. This next table shows the pay adjustments for county government employees uh, that are recommended by the executive. Uh, broken down into different components, and it shows they would have combined FY25 cost of about $52.9 million. However, as some of the pay adjustments take place during the fiscal year, the annualized cost is higher at $76.4 million, and this is the amount that would become part of the FY26 base budget. The other cost factor that is a little bit different this year than in recent years is the growth in overall retirement and group insurance costs, and that's shown on to the right-hand side of the table. Total retirement costs are up $22 million uh, in FY25. $12 million of this is related to the pension enhancements that were approved um, uh, last year as part of the budget in FY24. And $10 million is just general increases in retirement across, across um, all the government and all different employee groups. Active employee group insurance costs are up $12 million as well, reflecting trends that we are seeing in other agencies as well. And this slide shows the percent increase in the executive's recommended county government tax-supported compensation costs from FY16 to FY25 compared to the six-year projected annual growth rate. And this relates to the county's uh, compensation sustainab sustainability policy that we'll talk about momentarily. The tax-supported compensation growth rate in FY25 of 9.6% is more than three times the projected six-year growth rate of revenue of 3.1%. The GEO Committee will receive greater detail and information on all aspects of compensation and benefits and their work session on April 19th. 
The Office of Racial Equity and Social Justice, again this year, used the Operating Budget Equity Tool as part of the FY25 uh, budget process. And this required departments to answer specific questions related to their budget and programs and how those programs would reduce or eliminate disparities and or improve outcomes for communities of color and low-income communities. Council staff, as we did last year, will incorporate these ratings and information into our staff reports for committee review. And at ORESJ's budget work session with the GEO committee, um, there will be an opportunity to get into more detail um, with the department on the process and how they use that process to help the executive develop uh, his budget recommendations. This next group of slides summarizes how the executive's budget aligns with the, council's, uh, the county's adopted fiscal policies. First, with reserves, the continued good news here is that the county continues to be above the 10% reserve target, with projected FY24 year-end reserves of 15.0% and a projected FY25 year-end reserve uh, in the executive's budget of 11.6%. In terms of one-time revenues, the executive uses uh, $237.9 million in one-time reserves as part of his recommended budget with about $101.8 million funding ongoing expenditures, which, as Ms. Michelson mentioned, does not align with the fiscal policy requirements that one-time revenues should be used for one-time expenditures. Similar to last year, the Council will likely need to approve language in the budget resolution so that the Revenue Stabilization Fund, which is one of two components that make up the county's reserves, does not exceed 10% on its own, and staff will be working with OMB and the Office of the County Attorney um, on this uh, to follow up. In terms of spending affordability, the executive recommends exceeding the FY25 GEO bond debt limits uh, by $20 million and the overall budget that's on the capital side. And the overall budget on the operating side would it exceed the approved aggregate operating budget uh, ceiling by about $122 million. The executive's recommended OPEB uh, funding includes a slight reduction in pre-funding based on actual actuarial valuations for all the agencies and recommends current year funding for county government retiree health costs in alignment with the updated OPED funding policy approved by the council in December. Oops, I went too soon. Uh, the last policy item is the compensation sustainability policy, uh, which is that compensation costs for county government should grow over time at a similar rate to revenues. As detailed earlier in the chart, the executive's budget growth for compensation is significantly higher than projected revenue growth over the next six years. And my last slide before turning it back over to Ms. Michelson looks at the potential FY26 structural deficit. The recommended fiscal plan estimates that about $40.8 million in new revenues will be available for agency uses in FY26. However, the executive's budget includes known or likely FY26 expenditures of about $156.2 million. This includes annualization of FY25 pay adjustments, projected increases for uh, MCPS based on enrollment projections, and replacing the use of one-time reserves for ongoing expenditures. And together, these would exceed resources by about $115.4 million. Absent any changes, addressing this gap would require spending reductions or revenue increases in FY26. So moving on to the um, county uh, council president's uh, approach for dealing with this year's budget, um, the, the primary issue will be to focus on sustainability and attempt to reduce the structural deficit. Um, we think it would be very difficult to eliminate it, but we should do all we can to bring it down. And there are a few different ways to do that. Um, one is to look very critically at any new proposed uh, program, service, or position. Um, and we think those, that provides opportunities given the vast amount of growth in this budget. Um, the second is to look to the base budget to see if there are opportunities to reduce programs that are not as effective as they could be. Um, and finally, and I think this provides a really good opportunity, would be to try and replace ongoing expenditures with one-time expenditures where possible, to try and serve the same goals and needs um, with a one-time effort rather than one that adds to the base budget. Um, the council president has recommended that all tax-supported increases for new and enhanced programs will go on a list um, this year called the New and Enhanced Program List because 
the term reconciliationalist didn't seem to cut it and always confused people. We'll, we'll, we'll hope this, um, this name will do better, and if not, we'll continue to be creative in thinking of new ways to describe it. Um, we, the, the president has asked council staff to do a very ca careful review of potential reductions for the committee's considerations, both from the new programs and from the base um, where uh, we can find those and look for those opportunities. Um, and then, um, as noted earlier, the FY25 compensation and benefits is always looked at separately by the GEO committee and full council, will, which looks at these issues across all departments and agencies as opposed to the department by department review we do with other parts of the budget. So um, with this approach, there are a few things that the council may want to discuss today. A and the first one, and the one where council staff is recommending that you do make a decision today, is the executive's recommendation to increase GEO bonds in FY25. And we have concerns about this recommendation in particular for a number of reasons. First of all, um, it shifts from, um, it, it takes one-time funding that was being used in the CIP, replaces it with debt so that one-time funding can be used in the operating budget, increasing the structural deficit. Um, at the same time, it's not actually increasing capacity in the CIP. I know the Council has had some long and hard discussions about the needs in the CIP. Um, you may have been more receptive if this had provided additional capacity. It does not. It keeps the total level um, funding the same. And um, if the, the council has had, a, has had a goal of reducing debt in the CIP, as you know, it is 7 percent of the county operating budget. Every time we can bring that debt down, it frees money to be used for other important um, uses in the operating budget. And in addition, this has been something that the bond rating agencies has been very concerned about, our amount of debt. And we have promised them that it is our goal to bring it down. And the council has established, um, you know, policies to reduce the debt over time. So increasing it goes contrary to that. And that, that's, that's one that we we're hoping that you will focus on today. Um, the second, the goal of reducing the structural deficit. Um, as we noted, completely eliminating the 115 million structural deficit um, could be a real challenge. But if you can take it down by any meaningful amount, that will be a big improvement on this budget. Um, as we noted, the um, executive also exceeds the aggregate operating budget spending affordability guideline. If the council were to want to um, approve a budget at SAG limit, you would need to reduce this budget by $122.2 million. Um, we think, again, that would be a great challenge. And so um, unless it, the council feels otherwise, and you may want to state your goals today, it is likely that you will need the additional votes to exceed the spending affordability guideline for the operating budget. Um, and finally, we want to make sure that the council is aware that if you want to consider any tax increase, it would need to be introduced by next week, April 16th, in order to ha have a public hearing and discussion before you approve the operating budget. The executive has not recommended any tax increases, but we wanted to alert you that if you do want to consider it, um, you've got a, a short time frame to do that. Um, and with that, I'll stop and, and we'll turn it over to you for questions. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you very much uh, to you, Ms. Michelson. Your last time uh, doing this presentation, we very much appreciate all of your work and all of your leadership uh, guiding us through this very challenging process and uh, appreciate and will echo all of the comments that you uh, made. Uh, but, uh, this is a, a terrific memo. Obviously, it's a team effort, but someone has to lead the team. Uh, and Craig, we're very appreciative uh, of you leading this uh, effort. And uh, it is, you know, there's a lot here uh, for us to, 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 to understand. And really, uh, the gravity of the decisions that we're making and the impact that it's going to have, not just on this year's budget uh, and the services that we provide to residents, uh, but on future budgets and the future sustainability. Uh, that we have. We have to meet the moment that we're in, but we have to be able to be in a position to meet the moments that follow. We have a number of colleagues in the queue. Let me turn it over, starting to uh, with uh, Vice President Stewart. 
turn myself off. Um, thank you. Uh, I want to echo uh, the Council President's um, thanks for this excellent presentation and the memo and setting us up for our conversation on the budget this year. And Ms. Michelson, thank you um, as you enter your last budget uh, season. Uh, and Mr. Howard, um, I think Ms. Michelson said it best, um, taking very complex issues and being able to condense them down and present them to us um, is, has been very helpful. Um, I guess I will I, I kick it off uh, in terms of the issues you've put before us. Um, and as the Council Vice President and uh, Chair of Government Operations and Fiscal Policy, I'll speak to uh, the first item in particular, the recommendation to increase the, um, the GEO bonds in FY25. Um, and I will say that, you know, we got the CIP budget back in March and had uh, the $20 million in PAYGO, um, given what the Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee had said last year. I was actually very glad to see that. <laughs> I thought, oh, we're going to kick off this budget season um, on a good foot and in general agreement. When we received the overall budget and I saw that that PAYGO money was actually no longer there and then we were increasing um, the GEO bonds, um, I have to say that gave me a great deal of concern. Um, and I do not believe that we should be moving in this direction um, and that we should be looking at um, how, again, as we said, we have this one-time funds and how we can be using them for one-time expenses. Um, so I, I don't know if you want to go down each of these to speak to them or how we want to do the discussion today, but I thought I would address that, that first item. Old, yes, I think what I would suggest we do is everybody can, uh, we can go through the queue, give an opportunity for colleagues to ask questions or make any comments. You mm -hmm. certainly can make comments on these individual yep. items. Uh, I do think um, given the timeline, um, the geo bond decision we should make yes. today yep. and express an interest through a via straw vote uh, as well as property tax uh, uh, increase because something would have to be introduced mm -hmm. next week if we were going to go uh, in that. Uh, direction. Uh, the other two items I think are very important uh, and will set the direction of the approach as set forth in the, the memo that I had sent that uh, Ms. Michelson just uh, went through. I think those are going to be important. I don't know that those necessarily require a straw yeah. vote to a number, although if uh, colleagues are interested in that, we certainly could. Uh, the aggregate operating budget you know, specifically is a number you know yeah. there, there's a, a number that we would be exceeding 122 million dollars in this uh, particular case if colleagues are ready to make a decision of whether or not to exceed that I would entertain uh, motions on that uh, but ultimately the two most timely uh, as indicated by uh, staff are the geo bonds and the property tax mm -hmm. uh, increase question but I think we can wait to entertain motions until after colleagues have a chance to weigh in unless uh, you feel otherwise nope I'm good I will yield back my time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, Councilmember Jawando. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for the presentation. Um, and for the, it's always a mix of some good news, some cautionary tales, you know, so we appreciate it. And and since I've been on the council, council it's always been a mix of uh, some uh, honest and disagreement <laughs> between the executive and the council analysis. So I want to get into that because I think if I was watching this and I am watching it I did just watch it uh, I would want to say well those are two different views so let me hear why uh, and, I, and I've heard from the county executive just within the last week that uh, some of his thoughts uh, around the structural deficit issue uh, around the one-time expenditure issue uh, and so I want to ask just Brian, who, whoever on the team if you could address whichever order you'd like, uh, do you agree with the analysis of the one-time revenues and do you agree that there's a structural deficit to this extent? And if so, explain why you think that's okay or not okay or why the decision was made. Okay, I'll go first. Jennifer Bryant, uh, no one director. Was, no one was eager to go in front of <laughs> yeah. you there. Jennifer Bryant, director of the Office of Management and Budget. And I just want to thank all of the council members for having us here today to share um, some context on the county executive's point of view for his FY25 budget. Um, I would like to thank council staff for their work and really congratulate um, 
Executive Director Michael Sin on her well-deserved retirement and all of the contributions she's made to the County Council and to the residents of Montgomery County. It is well-deserved and we wish you the absolute best um, in the next part of your journey. Um, I don't know if I can answer that as directly as you asked the question, um, but what I will say is a budget, it represents a plan. It represents a spending plan um, that's crafted at a fixed point in time in this process. And during that time, it assumes that the resources on hand are going to be available to fund programs, particularly critical programs that um, help meet the needs of the residents of the county. Um, the county, this also is in part um, to get to the county's reserve target as um, Deputy Director uh, said that the county is ending, the county executive estimates that we will end FY25 with an 11.6% fund balance policy. And, and this provides some opportunities to take on things that we didn't expect. Quite frankly, um, some of the COVID era programs that were started a long time ago, a long time ago being three to four years ago, because of the pressures we were seeing in the community and the needs that we were seeing, were seeing in the community have not subsided. So the, the county executive had to make some very difficult decisions on whether to continue those programs. And that is where you see the largest increase in tax supported programs is because those programs will lapse this year. They are lapsing this year. The county executive made a conscious choice and decision to continue those programs. These are things like food and things, things. like food, um, MCOT teams, services to prevent and end homelessness. There is a lot in this budget that supports some of our most vulnerable residents in the county. Um, and with that, he had to make the decision whether or not the general funds would cover these programs and they would continue. The need is not decreasing. We are seeing increased needs. Um, we're also seeing high inflation and cost pressures throughout every department to continue to just um, the programs as they are right now without enhancements. We entered COVID under the guise of negotiated contracts for services that were already in place. And once we came out of COVID and started rebidding those contracts, recognize the environment that we were facing and the challenges that we would face in that environment where contracts were increasing exponentially. So that is the cost of just doing business as we see it today. Um, moreover, there is also high competitive labor market adding to the upward pressures of our wages. Um, there was the decline in the recordation tax and the recordation tax premium. All of those things had to be covered um, one way or another. Those are difficult decisions to make and the county executive chose to keep those programs intact so that we can take care of the needs that we're seeing out in the community. I, I appreciate that and if others want to chime in, I mean, I, you said it's a point in time, right? So even under the, if we took the executive's budget as is next year, no one disagrees on this, there would be a reserve of 11 point, I think it was 6% next year. So we would still be, that being said, we would have to make the decisions as we do every year to, to based on the economy and the revenues at that time, which are not completely knowable. We have projections, but we know that those are never <laughs> exactly right. Income tax in a good way, recordation tax in a bad way, for example. Um, but we would have to make the decision next year if things did go not as well as we thought to maybe trim back some of the programs that we had continued. Now there's obviously benefit to the people who are eating and getting mental health services and being taken off, off of the street and this year, fiscal year, who are receiving those services. Uh, but there's always a looming potential that we would have to roll things back. Now, obviously, there's a there could be a sunnier picture too. The interest rates go down, people start buying and selling houses again. The economy is better than we think, and we don't have to roll them back. And obviously, we would all want that. Um, so, I, I do think when you're looking at something that's a structural, you have to also balance it, which I think is what you're saying, with the needs of what we see right now. Mm -hmm. 
and what we can afford uh, this from this year, from July to July. Uh, realizing we might have to make difficult decisions decisions down the road, and there's always the expectations. You don't want to get people's hopes up that this will be around forever, but you want to meet their needs now. So that's a tough balance, um, and one that we have to grapple with. But I, I appreciate the, you know, the the reasoning. Is there anything you wanted to add on the any either of those questions? Sure, Joshua Waters, uh, Deputy Director for our Office of Management and Budget, and just to reinforce um, the directors statement that this is a it's looking at a point in time a budget is a point in time comparison if you take a look at the fy24 budget the executive's budget from last year that he introduced um, i think council staff's analysis at the time indicated there would be a 145 million dollar structural deficit for fy25 and i think when the council passed the budget it, it may have been around that maybe a little bit higher for the structural deficit so if you take a look at the analysis this year for fy26 the council staff analysis um, indicates there's 115 million dollar structural deficit so these numbers change every year and as the director said it really is a point in time comparison we're forced um, the executive is forced every year to put together a budget um, that that takes use of available resources um, whether they be ongoing one-time resources takes use of available resources to meet the demands um, that residents have placed upon county services and Ms. Michelson, to our staff, that, that, I was going to ask that point of, I do remember last year the number structural deficit number being quoted higher. How did that relate to the action we took and how that changed to 115 to what Mr. Mr. Waters just said? So I can address that. So last year at the council made significant reductions to the executive's budget, obviously reducing the, um, and they used, you, you all used the, those reductions to reduce the tax increase from 10% to 4.7%. To so you did not address the structural deficit. Um, as part of that, um, as part of your actions. So last year we did estimate it at $145 million, and the, the things that were part of the structural deficit still exist. Those did not change. What changed was that revenues came in higher than projected, about $198 million in FY24 higher than what was approved. So that's good news. So that covers the $145 million hole in the structural deficit plus a little bit more. However, when you look at having to use the additional revenues to cover that $145 million hole, that meant there was a lot less available for the different programs and services um, that, that you just you know, mentioned um, that folks need. And that's why the executive, you know, from a math perspective, um, needs to use the reserves to, as he said, to bridge that funding in FY25. I appreciate that. Um, well, just to comment on the geo bonds, you know, I was in favor of the increase across the board when we had that discussion. Uh, we didn't do that. I don't. I don't uh, know. I, I. I would guess the last question I'll ask and pass it on is, why did you do that, and what? How does it help us? It, to me, it doesn't seem to have a long-term impact. Is it just to make the numbers fit at this point in time? Was that, uh, yeah, if no one be wants, whoever wants to address Sure. Uh, Rachel Silverman, Office yeah. of Management and Budget. As you all will recall, um, there was a recordation tax write down in January and then a second one in March of $33.9 million. And taken into account with the constrained CIP um, that the county executive was working with, he just, he did not seem um, to think that it was feasible to address that shortfall with. Uh, reductions and deferrals only and so the geo bond increase is part of a balanced solution to addressing that while maintaining um, uh, strong resources for MCPS in uh, the council's efforts in order to address those structural uh, the structural CIP issues moving forward um, in addition as you observed um, that that increase is is for one year it's 20 million dollars and it does uh, keep the geo bond debt issuance in fiscal 25 uh, 40 million dollars lower than uh, the annual issuance was at its peak in 2018 so those are things to consider as far as the paygo uh, reduction um, as as you all are aware um, the county executive did hold some current revenue considerations um, from the January submission until March so he could have a full picture of, of the resources and demands um, for for general fund supported activities 
Um, and so in order to put forward some of those current revenue investments that he did in March, the $15 million um, in additional housing, as well as some investments in public safety for apparatus and other items, he did need to make an adjustment to what was allocated for PAYGO resources, as you all are aware. PAYGO is issuance for um, debt eligible expenditures, and so although PAYGO and current revenue both come from cash, you can't, you can't use PAYGO to support things like, um, for example, uh, fire, fire apparatus. And so that, that um, is why you see that adjustment as well. Okay. Well, I, I appreciate that. Um, I'll hold off. Last thing I'd ask is just if we could have an analysis. I think you've said you're going to create this to our staff just of the things that you see as one-time expenditures and that that's compared with. I, it would be great to have agreement between, you know, that these are the things that are one-time expenditures that our staff thinks are going to add to the structural deficit and that everyone's acknowledging so that we're just speaking from singing from the same choir sheet i do think it's an open question of what we fund this year to support our residents and how much of a structural deficit we're willing to deal with um realizing that you know we had, last year we were able to cover it but that has consequences as you mentioned mr howard uh, but we also have to recognize the needs of our residents. So. And, and we'll, we will be looking at all additions to the budget um, and categorizing them as either one time or ongoing, so the committees will have that information as you work through yeah. it. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. Appreciate it. It doesn't sound like there's disagreement. Just to clarify on the line of questioning, there's disagreement that there is a structural deficit. The question is whether or not that is something that should be of concern. You know, I think that is really a philosophical question but the math is what it is and I don't think anybody is disputing the math we have you know really great professionals both on the executive branch and on the council and in OLO and there is consensus on the math it's a question of you know what do we want to do with the math uh, with that let me turn it to Councilmember Glass uh, thank you mr. president uh, Ms. Michelson uh, thank you very much for another uh, thorough uh, review. I'm sure it's bittersweet, probably more sweet, uh, that this be uh, your last uh, budget briefing with us. And, and Mr. Howard, thank you as always for your diligent work uh, on this. Um, uh, I also pre appreciate the council president's approach to this, a continuation of what we can consider the closest thing to zero-based budgeting, making sure that we thoroughly review the base uh, and have everything else that is additional uh, on a separate list, whether it's called the new and enhanced list, uh, program list, the rec list, or as MCPS calls it, which uh, boggles my mind as well, the accelerators list, right? So we all have different names. A rose is a rose. Um, but I, I very much appreciate the, the approach. Uh, a few high-level things that I'm going to be keeping in mind moving forward. Uh, the vacancies, which was a central theme to last year's conversation where we were able to make most of our savings, uh, recognizing the job market, recognizing the inability to uh, hire, uh, and even to a finer degree, get some of the placements in the places where people will find them. Um, and we had a conversation last year about uh, hiring more HR personnel to help fill more jobs, and so I look forward to that conversation. Um, uh, as has been noted, uh, Montgomery County remains one of the few jurisdictions in the country that have maintained nearly all of our COVID-era social health care policies, and that it does not come free. Um, this is our commitment to our social safety net. It is our commitment to um, our residents who most need it. Uh, and, and I think it's best described as saying we are not averting our eyes from what we once saw. And that was the terminology during COVID. We saw issues, they needed addressing, um, and we continue to address them. And the existential question is, can we continue to do that? So I will be looking at those issues uh, in the budget. Uh, and then the third high level issue are our one-time expenditures. Clearly, um, reserves have been a topic of conversation uh, of importance to the council over the last year. It is why uh, last year we adopted a new policy as a council that any uh, reserve spending, particularly from the executive or explicitly from the executive sent over, uh, has a, no, a new thorough review where the GEO committee and the committee of jurisdiction take a look at that and vet it at an extra level. Uh, 
because we want to make sure the reserves um, are doing and being used for, for those expressed purposes. Um, now I just have, uh, I, I have a, a, a very specific question. I'll, I'll address, address it to Director Bryant um, or, or any me members of the team. Um, in the presentation, there was the data point regarding the impact and recordation fees. Another topic of conversation last year when uh, this council uh, voted to uh, increase impact and or recordation fees. Um, and there were various proposals, but every member of this council expressed support for increasing those fees. And now according to this uh, budget, there's a decrease in $35 million or 20%. Clearly, we know the interest rates. We know the housing availability. Um, and so the question I have, do you know what that difference would have been had we not increased the recordation fee? It's a tricky question. Hi, Nancy Feldman, uh, Department of Finance. Um, the hard part about what you're asking is the recordation fee increase didn't start until October. And so the amount of information that we have Right? You have to wait for the months to pass, and then you have to go review the collections, um, has put us in a position where the data is not sufficient to be able to answer that. We could go back, um, and happy to do so, go back to our fiscal impact statement and try and do a comparison of what we've gotten in this short period of time. Mm -hmm. um, we will say that um, Overall, recordation taxes, as you pointed out, are not where we had anticipated them to be when the budget was adopted in FY24. Um, the conditions that have led to that may be getting to a stable low point, um, but we don't know that. We're not seeing that yet in the numbers, but we will certainly go back and get you the answer yeah, to that th question as best we can. Th thank you for that honest response because so in FY25, uh, an expected decrease of $35 million or 20%. In FY24, the current fiscal year, uh, $41.2 million less. So those numbers are correct. Right, yeah. Um, yeah Mr. Howard, you're right. Uh, and, but, but moving forward, for FY26 to 30, there is expected, italicize, underline, bold the word expected, uh, an annual rate increase of 7.34%, somewhere around there. The reason I bring this up is because just last week, we took up the MCPS CIP and really, really tough decisions. And out in the community, people are asking me, and I know they're asking colleagues, well, didn't you just increase these recordation fees? Didn't you expressly say they were going to help these schools and now you're not funding those schools, you're delaying them further? And clearly trying to uncover how worse it would have been had we not taken the steps last year. You know, hindsight's a, a, a tough, um, so it, it is not easy to, to talk in those terms, but I think as we're addressing the budget and the concerns and anxieties people have, uh, it need, there needs to be a comparison. Um, because we look at Woodward, we look at Damascus, we look at Northwood, it could have been worse. Well, we all agree, I think unanimously, that the status quo and what we're putting forward is not what we want it to be. It could have been worse. Uh, and then that last point I'll make um, is about last year's budget and the very, very tough decisions that were made. Uh, this budget is very different. We're not starting the budget with a 10% property tax increase. We're not starting the budget with labor contracts, which all of us unanimously supported. And so there are different things baked into this budget. Uh, and to my colleagues who are now in their, their second budget cycle, it's going to be very different. The questions that we'll be facing um, are more specific because we have to reconcile the bonding authority, the spending that we have, that the county executive has outlined, um, and, and looking at the reserves as well. But what what concerns me um, is that we all have to have very honest conversations. 
And that is a very tough thing to do sometimes. Uh, and so as we move forward, um, you know, as I noted, I'm going to be looking at the vacancy rates, the social safety net, and the one-time expenditures. Um, but recognizing that just like last year, we have to have a balanced budget at the end. And the property tax increase that we implemented last year was required at the time to balance the budget. There should be no revisionist history about that. It was required at the time. And as Director Bryant noted, budgets are one-time snapshots. Thankfully, there were other elements of the budget that improved, that now allow us to have a thorough vetting of the reserves and determine what those should be used for. And, and I'll close on this. Um, I believe our reserves are best used for capital projects, which are absolutely one time. And it's exactly why I asked about the impact fees, or the recordation fees, and referenced the MCPS budget. The reserves should be used to fund the capital projects we need today. Um, and I look forward to working with my colleagues as we work through this budget. And at the end of this session, we'll talk about the transportation CIP. <laughs> so remember what I said. I'll be continue. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll keep the same thought then. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Appreciate that. I will note and r remind uh, colleagues, as you uh, uh, were referencing uh, last year, the Government Operations Fiscal Policy Committee very much put forward a significant proposal to use uh, one-time funds in the capital budget. The council agreed on that. The county executive uh, didn't. And so this has been an ongoing part of that uh, conversation. It certainly is in keeping with directly the fiscal policies that we have adopted to only use one-time funds for one-time expenses. With that, let me turn it to Councilor Baluki. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, I just, again, thank you, Mr. Howard, Ms. Michelson, my seatmate up here, <laughs> for all of your hard work, Ms. Bryant. Um, I appreciate everything that all of you all at OMB have to do. These are not easy things and not topics that are easy to distill into um, discrete talking points, if you will, right? Everything's interdependent and everything's flexible and things shift and move over time. Um, sometimes that shifting and moving gives the public great anxiety, right? Because then they worry, what shifting and moving are we all going to do that's going to impact their day in, day out? And, and that's the thing that I carry with me all the time when I'm thinking through this, because that's what I hear from my constituents. That's what I hear from, you know, I call it the, the conversation at the grocery store, one we all should be having regularly or on the sideline at the kids lacrosse game, because that's taking the temperature of what the residents are feeling, what's bothering them, what's worrying them. And right now the affordability of living in Montgomery County is a huge issue along with, you know, as I say, my parents live in Delaware and our budget is big as the state of Delaware's, right? And they don't, they don't have a sales tax, right? They have corporate taxes that pay for a lot of the things that they get over there. But also, they don't see a lot of tangible things that we do have here in the county, and they do notice. So getting what you pay for, if you will, as a taxpayer is something that is top of mind when people are thinking about how well their government's working, what are their tax dollars going for and doing. And that's where I'm seeing cracks right now. I think folks were patient for a while during the pandemic because we all needed to be and things were vastly amiss. And it's not that our needs have gone down. As noted, there are still things that are very much alive here. It's a question of how we are going to deal with them. And last year at this time when we were all going through this, majority of us for the first time, we were dealing with federal government funding streams and programs that were terminating, that were placing local governments and state governments in a very difficult position because things were were ending abruptly. And, and you know, we didn't want that to happen to our residents. We didn't want to see those things happen at that time because an abrupt cutoff is never good for anyone. Um, and so it was going to need to be a phased in approach 
to how we manage this for the long term. And here we are again, and we now need to really grapple with that. Again, how do we manage the needs we have, maybe not doing them exactly as we did in pandemic times, but moving forward in a way that works, that isn't putting us behind the eight ball financially in a way that we cannot manage without creating more problems from a fiscal perspective, because that's what we cannot afford to do. Um, and I and I want to I want to thank you, Ms. Bryant, for for again emphasizing that this is done as a fixed point in time. And one of the things we always have to account for is what may come later. Right. And if 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 you swing too wide one direction or another, you're not prepared when that other thing comes your way. And we do need to be mindful of that as well. Um, you know, I, I think that we have to have capacity for the unexpected. We have to have some and we have to decide what our comfort level is with what that should be and how that should work. Um, but I, I and I've said this many times and I appreciate Councilmember Glass and, and Council Vice President Stewart for for saying this as well. I, I do have a firm line where when it comes to one time funding being used for ongoing expenses. It's not how I would spend my money myself. How can I spend taxpayers' money that way in a way that's not sustainable? Um, that's dangerous. And, you know, that's something that we really need to think about in terms of our affordability, sustainability, and impact on the community in both directions, both in services, understanding we have to have tough discussions, and also on the bottom line for our residents. And, and that's the balance I hold dear in the analysis we are embarking upon. And that's what I am hoping we can all come to a good positive collective resolution on knowing and recognizing, as Councilmember Glass said, these require hard conversations because many, many things are worthy. Um, but especially in the capital projects arena, where that is an appropriate place to use one-time funds, We've had to make hard decisions there, and yet we know those capital projects aren't going to get any less expensive. And so to the extent that we, if we do have things, if we are then delivering to the public things that they can see that are tangible, that they have been asking for, then we're using it for a one-time cost. That's a way to give them what they need. So with that, I yield back. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Councilmember Lukey. Let me turn it to Councilmember Kett. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And I, too, want to join that great chorus of thanking everybody, and especially Marlene and, and everyone else, but especially Marlene. I, I think uh, uh, Councilmember Glass said it was bittersweet, and, and I, I don't even know how, how uh, the, the word sweet could get in this, but, but you truly have done a marvelous job the entire time I've been here, as has Craig and, and, and others as well. But you will, you will be missed, and we are very pleased that we know your phone number. You know, um, when, when, uh, whether you might be pleased or not, it doesn't matter to us, but, but the, the GO Committee, uh, which I've been on now for the, the three terms that I've been here, has been very, very fortunate a, a, over the years. And, and, I, and I say that uh, <coughs> Council President Friedson and I served with Council Member Navarro when, when she was there, and Vice President Stewart has done an unbelievably good job. She was a mayor. She knows how to do a good job. And, and um, she's done a, a very, very good job on, on a very important discussion. When, we, when I first got there, um, debt service, I used to, uh, you know, I campaigned on it. I said, you know, if, if debt were a department in Montgomery County, it would be the third largest department we have. I came from a place that had no debt. I mean, it was a scary, scary thing to me. And we knew that, I used to always say that my mother says, if you take all the medicine at once, it doesn't help you, it'll kill you. So we had to do it slowly, and we've gotten to the to a much better place. We're, we're never going to be, you know, to no debt. We can't be. It's air, the way our system is set up, it just doesn't work that way. But we certainly don't want to have a structural deficit, and, and that's what we were working towards and continue to have those issues. 
you, you know the the um, the uh, recordation tax is probably one of the maybe the most volatile tax we have. I mean, and 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 yeah, and there again, it's depending on all these other factors, and we want to make certain that that we are figuring this thing out. And this is a difficult thing to figure out a budget. You know, everybody, ah, it's just a budget. Well, it isn't just. It really is a, a document that 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 gets you through the year and beyond. But the the whole idea is that we need to be very cautious on how we predict. I, I, uh, you know, we we talk about that a bond increase could be for this year, you know. But you, you start getting a bond increase, you pay for it for many more than one year, and that becomes a concern. We're, and and um, I I also just recently met with the uh, HR department. Yeah, uh, and and uh, I have to tell you, they're doing a much better job. I I, I said. Publicly or to them that day that that uh, of all the departments we ever deal with they're perhaps the most important department because they deal with all the other departments they're the the group that gets us the people that are doing the job in the in the on the you know, on the front lines and every other place and so we need to make certain that we're competitive we need to make certain we have the money to pay them there are employees who do a terrific job for us but. Bottom line on this is the government is in the service business. That's what we're in. We, we, we can, uh, but we have to figure out how we're going to provide those services that our public needs and deserves, uh, uh, all, you know, all the time, and how we can do it efficiently. And I do agree that the reserves should be used for capital improvements. Uh, and and I I think if the question comes down to, and I think uh, Vice President Stewart mention this and, and maybe in a different way, but if it comes down to a tax increase, I'm not in favor of a tax increase. I'm not in, in favor of, of changing the, the bonds the way we're doing it. And the whole idea that if our only choices are a tax increase or a savings plan, I'm not in favor of a savings plan either. And I think we have to be clear that the savings plan means that we go through a budget and then just say, I'm kidding because we take away that money that we just went through. And I'm not in favor of doing that either. I think we need to do it up front. I think we need to be as cautious as we can. And I think that we should not be changing uh, the anything for the bonds or the for PECO. Thank you very much, Ms. Britz. Thank you. Uh, next, let me turn it to Councilman Albernaz. Thanks. Feels a little bit like deja vu. Uh, we, we've been having these conversations for so long, um, but I just want to start from this place and acknowledge the great work that Ms. Michelson has done. Among your many legacies, Ms. Michelson, will be that you played a huge role in ensuring our fiscal responsibility during your tenure, not just as executive director, but before that as well. And so, um, and you've put together a really extraordinary team. Craig is an incredible example of that. And so uh, I feel very good about what we've been able to accomplish and, and where we're going. But thank you for that leadership. So uh, just a couple of points on that uh, percent increase in county government tax supported compensation costs sort of jumped off the screen. Um, and I want to focus on that for a little bit. So I did support and all of us did unanimously the seven and a half percent increase last year, acknowledging coming out of the pandemic with the challenges that we've been having in recruitment and retention across the board, that we had to make some bold steps to ensure that we supported uh, and fairly compensated our county employees. We are only as good as the staff that we have to carry out these myriad of programs and services that we have. But, but if you combine FY24 to F and FY25, that's a 17% increase uh, in overall compensation. And I know the chart goes back to FY16, but I've been around for 18 years. I can't recall a time where we've had, especially in two cumulative years, that big of an increase. And if you pull the thread even further, when you look at some of the decisions that were made in the early 2000s um, with salary and compensation, and then nobody could have predicted the terrible recession that we had, but the terrible recession coupled with the unprecedented increases at the time in salary and compensation were, were led to the fiscal cliff that none of us ever want to remember. So 
but I recall in our conversation last year that um, there had, as there always is, uh, we, we did an evaluation and assessment of salary and compensation as compared to other jurisdictions. And there were areas where we fell well short, public safety being one of them, ride on drivers being another, but we made those adjustments and, and we made those adjustments aggressively. Could you talk a little bit about the justification for the 9.6% on top of the 7.5%? Sure, thank you for the question, Council Member Albernaz. So the 9.6% does not just encompass the new negotiated agreements with the uh, with our labor partners. If you look at the, on page 10 of the packet, um, if you look at the, the table above that, you'll see the additional line items that go into that, including 28 million just, just from the annualization of last year's compensation increases that the council approved, as well as other uh, items the council's already approved, pension enhancements, um, and then other retirement costs that have gone up year over year. So of the, the total increase, not all of that is directly related to the FY25 recommended pay and benefits adjustment, only a, a smaller part of that. I would say of the 116 million, it's less than half of that. The other items that are on there um, are, are items that have already been approved, and these are just the carry forward costs for that into FY25. That's an important point, and I like your beard, Josh. So good luck. Um, so I, I, I would just, you know, caution us. Obviously, we'll go through as we deliberate and discuss, and, and I appreciate that point. It's an important one to make. Um, but as we go into FY26, as an example, we have to level off because clearly this is not sustainable. Um, I mean, the, the, it, it's just pretty, pretty straightforward and obvious. And we're discussing the 20 million in the GO bonds, but the salary and compensation adjustments is going to have a significantly more long-term fiscal impact than the 20 million that we're talking about in GO bonds. So this is, you know, because so much of the county's overall budget is made up in salary and compensation. Um, and so that this is the game right here, uh, and, and we have to be very judicious and cautious. Um, with regards to the recordation tax, I appreciate uh, Council Member Glass's questions, and, and I also acknowledge and appreciate the honesty in the responses. It is too early to know what the impact of our decision was last year, and we do have to look at the data and we have to reflect. And all of my colleagues from the dais, when we uh, discuss this said that you know it is something we would have to obviously as we always do evaluate um, because the 200 percent increase year over year is significant uh, and we have to be honest with ourselves and once we do have more data and that data is evaluated if there is an indication that that significant percentage increase in some way has played into the diminishing of the recordation taxes we've received we have to be. We have to look at that uh, and 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 right size if if that is in fact the case. Um, but the jury's out, and the, the 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 information has not come in yet. So that's obviously something we'll have to look at closely. Um, with regards to the geo bonds, so I believe strongly uh, that we should not be adding to our structural deficit and debt. That's clear, but. Uh, the, the obvious rub is, you know, as chair of the HHS committee, we see every day the needs that continue to persist in our community, and particularly in the food security space, that's just one, there are many others, um, we, we can't scale back the investments that we've made because that will have social society diminishing returns that will cost us so much more on the back end. And so I know we have to make a decision today on the GO bonds. I'm struggling with that, frankly, because that's $20 million that we're going to have to find through the budget process that won't be easy uh, to, to address. Uh, and as we all know, by the time we get to the end of the budget process, there are many more interests uh, than there are resources available. And we would be taking away yet another possible tool that we would have to address those needs if we make that decision right now. Uh, I believe strongly I don't support a tax increase. Um, and so that, that is not a tool that, that I would feel comfortable using at this time. So I'm not prepared at this specific moment until we go through 
the budget process and hear from our respective executive branch departments on what their needs are, the assessment and evaluation of the programs and services, the additions of those evaluations and programs. I mean, that's an important part of the budget process. Um, and so I'd be reluctant to take that tool away before I know that information. So I'm, I'm torn on that one. Thank you, Council Member Balcom. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you to everyone who pulled this together and particularly to Marlene. Um, thank you so much, although I'm in denial, so we'll start there. Um, so I understand that last year we had a structural deficit of 144, 145 million, and this year it's only 115 million. But as Councilmember Glass mentioned, last year the council was faced with proposed 10% uh, tax increase which we managed to cut in half. Um, so speaking for myself, that does not indicate that I'm comfortable or support a structural deficit. Uh, we have to do everything we can to get that down. Uh, to, um, and to that point, I agree with my colleagues that one-time funds should not be used uh, for anything other than uh, one-time expenses and shouldn't add to the deficit. Um, so just because we don't have a tax increase in front of us, and I am not suggesting that we do, that doesn't mean that we don't have very difficult deci decisions to make. I support pulling out the new and enhanced programs to determine the necessity of these new additions, but just as important as identifying the new programs, we do need to look at existing programs and positions that should be eliminated. And as we discussed last year, with the number of vacancies, that gives us the potential opportunity to eliminate positions without eliminating people. Uh, and as we go through the, the budget line by line and review these new programs, we may need to look more deeply into the base budget and make trade-offs in order to bring in some new programs. We're going to have to let some um, older existing programs go. And we need the partnership of the department heads and the executive branch to make those choices. So if the county executive is asking us to add new programs and the departments are asking us to bring in new positions and new programming, there has to be some programming that just isn't being effective. And so I would hope that we have a partnership there uh, with the executive branch. Uh, I do want to speak just very briefly about the spending affordability guidelines. At the very beginning of the, of the discussion, the budget discussion, we look at revenues and make a determination about how much we as a county can afford. Last year, as a rookie council member and an accountant, I thought, well, that's a very sensible approach, um, very prudent, but then we never went back and looked at it. We need to look at the underlying premise of whether we can afford to do what we decide to do. I appreciate uh, Councilmember Katz's um, uh, point that we need to be very deliberative in the choices that we make. And I also um, understand the balance that uh, Councilmember Albernos just mentioned. Um, we need to make a very clear distinction between what we want and what we absolutely need to service to, to serve our community. And so um, I'm ready to make those tough decisions and um, uh, and appreciate my colleagues' efforts. Thank you. Appreciate that and just note as part of the process as laid forward, looking into the base budget as well and scrutinizing those decisions while prioritizing filled positions versus vacant positions. So we're now eliminating encumbered positions as part of the approach to the budgets. I appreciate you, you raising that. Just wanted to clarify. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez. I am not ready to say goodbye to Marlene, so I will not say how wonderful she has been, how awesome she and what a great partner she has been for the Economic Development Committee when we did not have a staffer, and um, I'm just not ready. So with that said, I strongly agree with uh, pretty much all the comments that my colleagues, uh, Gail Bernos and Councilmember uh, Balcom have just stated, so I don't want to repeat it, uh, but I would just emphasize something that was said by um, the gun executive team that, you know, this pandemic has still, the consequences are still very vivid in our community. I see it in my district when I see, 
you know, kids depressed, kids that don't have activities to go to because of lack of funds, parents working three, four jobs, um, not having reliable transportation system, even though we have a great ride on and, and system, still not fast enough for low-income community members. So the needs are there and they're huge. So I, I am just not ready to say that not to the go bonds. I, I just really need more time to t talk to different um, department heads and see what's realistic this year. I don't know what's gonna happen in the future. I don't know if we're gonna have another pandemic, hopefully not, but I'm a realist and I, I just need more information coming in to do the responsible thing. And I know that our community is suffering deeply. I mean, just go to any of these hubs that you know distribute food or you know and you can see the long lines and just talk to people and see how how much they're struggling um people don't go out and to look for food for free because they want to you know they do it out of necessity and i feel responsible to ensure that we're doing the right thing with our with our money and um so i wanted to put that on the record i yield back thank you council Merced. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, thank you, Marlene. Thank you, Craig. Um, and thank you to the county executive staff for being here. Um, this is our second year in the budget, and so I, I feel more confident in how we will be able to tackle it this year. But um, unfortunately, um, challenges still exist. And so um, I appreciate the focus on sustainability and affordability of the capital and operating budgets and um, receiving the recommendations, evaluating um, how these new and enhanced programs um, will, how we will pay for them, whether we will continue to support uh, these new programs that um, will replace old programs or um, are we going to do one time or ongoing expenditures um, it's it's tough uh, do we want to contribute to a structural deficit no um, you know as the chairman mentioned for HHS you know we see a lot of these challenges up close um, and I'm thinking about the programs that we're going to have to make decisions on and the recommendations that staff uh, will make, the initial recommendations on um, what will be one time and what will be ongoing. And ensuring that it's done through a racial equity lens, um, ensuring that we are continuing to advance equity is very important and also minimizing the negative impacts of this and so um, it's hard to make that decision to um, decide on uh, foregoing that additional um, uh, um, resource um, with the, the uh, geo bonds and so um, if there's an opportunity to delay that situation, to delay that, that vote, um, so we can um, truly evaluate what the impact uh, will be and what specific um, uh, sacrifices need to be made, um, I would support uh, delaying that vote. Um, and uh, you know, I think about some of these positions and how we are actually evaluating um, some of the increases that we made last year, the significant increases. Um, and if we are going to continue funding these programs from last fiscal year, how are we evaluating learning outcomes um, and ready to replace those programs already with new ones um, to address some of the ongoing challenges that we're seeing, especially in um, our schools. Um, seeing that we have, what, a thousand vacancies. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about 
the restructuring of county government and what that uh, would look like. Um, but my question goes back to how do we sustain this um, when we're not seeing revenue grow the way that uh, we anticipate it when um, we don't know what the future holds fiscally. Um, it's very concerning. Um, and so while, again, I do not want to raise taxes, I don't want to contribute to a structural deficit, um, yes, difficult decisions are going to have to be made, but um, I look forward to having that discussion and want to ensure we have the resources to make those difficult decisions if we have to fund uh, these programs. And I think we will be better equipped uh, to make those decisions as the meetings uh, continue. Um, and so I'll yield there. Thank you, Councilmember Mink. Thank you. Thank you, my colleagues, for the thoughtful comments. Thank you to Craig Merlin for an excellent packet and overview. Um, and, uh, and a shout out to the Springbrook uh, IB students who are, have joined us uh, to visit the council today and are here in the back of the room. It's awesome. Hello. Um, as has been said, the needs are still great and they are increasing. And as the chair of HHS noted, uh, failing to keep up with those baseline needs uh, is going to increase our costs for the programming needed to remedy that in the future. Uh, so part of being fiscally responsible, I think, is keeping that in mind, that spending more on some of these programs now is going to save us some costs later. So obviously there's a, a lot of balancing to be considered here. Um, keeping people housed is expensive, and it's also much cheaper than trying to get unhoused people housed. Um, the strategy of using one-time expenditures on ongoing expenses is uh, concerning <laughs> does delay the delivery potentially delay the delivery of bad news from one year to the next year in the hopes that that news might be better in a year when it's possible that that news could be worse in a year um, again we also have programming that uh, some of this is uh, must be must be covered um, in my own household. I also, as Councilmember Lutke said, would not want to make decisions that had me spending uh, one-time money on ongoing expenses. But if my children were hungry, I think I might consider spending some one-time funds that I got on some of those one-time expenses. Um, it's tough decisions that people in our community are facing right now today, and that's some of the programming that we're talking about. Uh, so I agree with colleagues who have said that um, it would be good to get more information about programming. Um, not prepared to say no to the GO bonds today either, um, but it, it is a very difficult conversation. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you to all colleagues. Thank you to executive and council staff. I'll just say, uh, you know, appreciate the comments earlier about the budget being really like a plan, but we do have plans. We have a fiscal plan, we have fiscal policies. The budget is spending authorization. It's literally how much money the government is allowed to spend based on the revenue that we believe that we have. It's it's more than a plan, it's not a budget, it's the spending author, you know, it's, it's not a budget plan, it's, it's an actual budget. And too often, unfortunately, we have ignored our fiscal plans and we have ignored our fiscal policies. And there are a number of instances in that as council staff has raised in the budget and that creates some, some challenges. We eventually are going to have to confront these questions. We can't have all things. We can't not want to increase the structural deficit, not want a potential tax increase in a subsequent year, perhaps next year, and fund everything that we would would like. At, at, at some point, you know, something has to give. I've said before, I'll say again, hope is not a fiscal strategy. And we need a fiscal strategy, and we really have fiscal strategies in our policies and in our fiscal plan, but the key is to hold ourselves to those plans and those policies, and if we don't think they're appropriate, to, to change them. The challenge with the GO bond is it's like putting a mortgage on a credit card. It's a double form of debt. 
because we're both increasing the debt that will be paid over 20 years and we're adding to the structural increases in the costs of the underlying operating budget because most of that funding is going to go towards personnel. And the challenge that we have had is that we're both increasing compensation and benefits to address the real serious issues that we have with recruitment and retention, which colleagues have talked about are real, but also increasing the number of positions at an astronomical level. And that is a recipe for disaster. You can't both increase compensation benefits and dramatically increase the number of positions and not have a funding mechanism uh, to, to pay for it. So uh, that, that, that's the, the challenge that we are grappled with here, the tough choices that we always have to make in every budget uh, and uh, what we'll, we'll have to address. Uh, the other challenge that we have is the transparency about this process. It is not transparent from my perspective to wait until the very end to make all of the big decisions in the budget. It, you know, that is not the best approach. It doesn't allow us to have meaningful conversations with the proper context during the committee review, which is when most of the budget work uh, gets done. Uh, and it doesn't allow the benefit to the public and to those who are impacted by these decisions to understand you know, what we're doing and, and why we're doing it. So um, I appreciate where, where colleagues are. Uh, we do have a couple uh, decision points that staff has put uh, before us. One of them is the geo bond, um, and uh, you know, we'll take straw votes today on that, as well as the tax increase. It seems more uh, Clear uh, on the, the tax increase, uh, you know, there's, there's nothing in the, the, the budget currently, but the tax increase would, would have to be uh, introduced essentially this week. It would need to be worked on like starting today and tomorrow uh, to be able to, uh, to, to, to move forward with the proper notice. So uh, with that, we'll first uh, 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 take a straw vote on the uh, $20 million in uh, geo bonds. Sure. Point, point of clarification or point of interest? Point of, yeah, sure. Councilmember Joanna. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, happy to take the straw votes because they're obviously non binding, but uh, I, I will say I don't, I don't remember us doing this at the budget briefing before um, where we're being kind of asked to make decisions. And I understand your perspective, but I, I don't think we've ever done this. Um, we since we have been. done it in the past on OPEP. So, yeah, on OPEP. Right. Sure. So yeah. typically there's been, you know, not every year, but some years, one issue that we think is good to decide early on. Um, I, I agree. I do remember we have done it on OPEP. But my, my point is, you know, this afternoon we're going to have, we've had we've had two of, of the budget hearing, two of five. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We're going to hear from the public over the next several hours about the budget to make a decision uh, you know, at least even initially, I, I, I just would ask that we consider just holding on this decision. That that would be my request. We'll see where colleagues are, and if there's not enough colleagues who are willing to vote today, we can delay it. I, ultimately, we can delay it till next week, but we, we're going to have to make a decision on this because we can't go through the process unless we want to make this decision in a back room at the end, which I don't think is the level of transparency that people are asking for from us, we, we have to make this decision. And ultimately, the, you know, this is very similar to OPEB decisions that we've made in the past where there is a finite amount of money that we need to figure out and needs to be part of the committee review and discussion. It's not the biggest decision, which is on compensation benefits, over 80% of our uh, budget, but we do make that early on and we force ourselves to make that uh, early on. So unless, you know, there, there was really only two options here, like we've faced with OPEB, you either have to make a decision early on in, in the process as a straw vote. It's not binding, but it sets the strategic direction, you know, to, to start, um, or you wait till the very end. And, you know, my view is waiting till the very end is problematic, um, you know, for, 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 for the reasons expressed. So anyway, we'll Take a straw vote. If you're not comfortable voting, you don't, you know, don't vote. Um, and if there isn't enough support to vote on it, we can uh, hold off. But you know, ultimately, we're going to have to make 
tough decision sooner rather than later. To Sorry, one other clarifying point. Um, my apologies. I don't want this to go on because I know we have folks waiting for the next item. I, I just wanted to say I appreciate the views shared today. I appreciate these are these are very tough decisions um, to make, um, particularly. I think particularly this year. Right, we have these reserves, we have these one-time funds, and we have these great needs. Um, but I would say um, I am in favor of doing a straw vote today, even though we don't have all the information and we need to continue gathering that because I I think we need a sense of where we are, and if we're split, we're split, and that gives a sense to each of us and to the staff. Um, but we do have to make some difficult decisions in committee, and I think it would be helpful for all of us just to know where, get a sense of where we are right now in order to help guide us through that. It's, as Council Member Jawando said, it is non binding. There's a lot of other decisions that have to be made, but I think getting a sense of where we are right now with uh, the bonding would, I think, would be helpful as we're moving through the budget process. Thank you. Councilor Mack. Okay, so straw vote. Uh, those in favor of increasing the twenty million dollar uh, geo bond debt, please indicate by raising your hand. So this would be to use. Yeah, okay. put it in context. Okay. Sure. I just had questions about the phrasing of the question, but okay, all right. But I, I should not be the one to revise it. But um. all right, if would it make it easier? Would you, those in favor of maintaining the spend, spending the capital spending affordability guidelines, so not including an additional twenty million dollar debt, please indicate by raising your hand. That would mean. The the straw vote is on whether or not we're going to increase the debt. $20 million exceeding the capital spending affordability guidelines that this council agreed upon a couple months ago. No, that, 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 that have been used in the operating And if the answer budget. is maybe, <laughs> or I'm not sure yet, then, they, then, then I would vote then a vote, vote. Then abstain or vote against I just want to clear that for, the, for colleagues. I just think, because yeah. if, you, if, if you're sure you don't want to do it, vote for, you know, say that now, but you know. Councilmember Albanas. I was going to say what Councilmember Jawando just said. I just want to make clear that, you know, we we are, I, I get the point, I do. I, I respect that we have to set a tone, but we also have an entire budget deliberation to go through in committee structure, which we've done every single year. And so uh, the OPEB decision is not an apples and oranges comparison because those were uh, commitments that we had made to retired employees. And while, yes, contributing to a structural deficit versus a not structural deficit, I just don't think it's fair to compare the two. So uh, I will be abstaining from this vote, not because I don't believe in fiscal responsibility, but because I want more information. That's fair. And you colleagues are welcome to abstain. So we'll see where, the, where the, you know, as, as the vice president said, you know, it's important for us to understand where we're at to be able to make decisions in, in context. With that, we're going to take a vote. Is there a motion? Is there a formal process? It's, it's a straw vote, so it doesn't require a motion. Okay. All right, th those in favor of maintaining the GEO bond level that the council has previously approved, so not moving it into the, in, into the operating budget, please indicate by raising your hand. So that is six votes. Those opposed, raise your hand. That's no votes. Those abstaining. That's five votes. So there are six votes uh, not in favor of that, so majority of the body. Uh, we're going to take a vote on uh, tax increase, straw, straw vote, just so staff knows those don't wish to increase uh, property tax rate in this budget. As part of this budget process, please indicate by raising your hand, maintaining the current property tax rate. That's unanimous. Um, we're not going to take specific straw votes because there isn't a specific uh, number, but there are 
you know, decision points that have been raised to us on the aggregate operating budget uh, that's uh, 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 b before us and a number of the other uh, issues. Are there any other comments or questions on this item from colleagues? Is there anything else needed from staff? Okay, great. We are going to move on to our two agenda items that continue the council's review of the county executive's recommended FY 25 to 30 capital improvements program. The first agenda item uh, is agenda item number two, uh, work session on the FY 25 to 30 capital improvements program for transportation pro uh, projects. Chair Glass, would you provide the recommendation from the Transportation and Environment Committee work sessions, please? I can do that. I will wait for staff to work their way up. So over the last few months, the Transportation and Environment Committee has taken up the CIP. I want to express my appreciation to my uh, committee colleagues, uh, to Mr. Kenny, his first CIP with, with us, uh, and uh, of course to, to DOT uh, and, and OMB for, for their work. Um, broadly put, there are about 113 um, active projects in this CIP, ranging from mass transit to parking, roads, pedestrian safety, facilities, bikeways, uh, and bridges. And uh, these are all incredibly important for us to uh, fulfill our, our uh, daily lives, get around, get to work, get to school, um, and get outdoors as well. Um, these projects are gonna help all corners of Montgomery County. Um, and uh, some of the highlights uh, regarding active and ongoing projects. Uh, there are, is funding to support uh, facility renovations in Bethesda parking, uh, for Bethesda parking. There is funding for the Silver Spring and Bethesda bike parking facilities. We have improvements to the Wheaton parking facilities, to the Boyd's Transit Center, to the North Bethesda, Metro entrance, the Burtonsville access road, uh, and bus rapid transit phase two, which goes through uh, 355. Um, you know, all of that is to say that this CIP touches all corners of the county, which is incredibly important. There are also a number of new bridges or funding for bridges, the off-lane pedestrian bridge, the Brook Road Bridge, the Redland Road Bridge, the Schaefer Road Bridge, um, and much like with the school CIP, um, there were some tough conversations as well. Uh, the county executive did recommend delaying several projects for fiscal reasons. Um, those notable delays include Summit Avenue extension, Bradley Boulevard improvements, the Capitol Crescent Trail Tunnel, the Goldsboro Road Bikeway and Sidewalk, the Forest Glen Passageway, Tuckerman Lane Sidewalk, and Observation Drive extended, and the committee uh, went through all of those uh, very thoroughly uh, and decided to bring six of those seven projects to the council for consideration um, through uh, our reconciliation project uh, process. Uh, the one, of, one project of the seven that we did not put forward was Observation Drive. Um, I can let the district council member uh, expand upon that later, but basically uh, there are a few land issues that we want to, that need to be determined before we can put money into something whose alignment, which alignment of uh, remains unclear at this point. So we can't build something if we don't necessarily know where it's gonna go. That's the, the question. Um, but then also I'll, I'll close before turning it over uh, to Mr. Kenny to walk us through. Throughout this process, I appreciate all the council members who wrote letters of support for projects in their district. Uh, this is the direct outgrowth of um, those, those supermarket conversations that council member Ludke referred to um, earlier. We all know that there are people who are calling for all of these projects and more. 
things that are not even in this CIP, but needs we know need to be met. Um, and because of council members asking for projects in their districts, uh, there is information in the packet as to where the CIP fundings are going. Um, recognizing we have seven districts, uh, five of which are represented by council members in their first term um, who literally want to bring home the bacon. And so, not literally, um, <laughs> maybe in, in districts two and seven, they want to bring home the bacon in, in those districts. Um, uh, thank you, Council Member Katz. Um, <laughs> it was, it was. Um, so, uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Ken, uh, Mr. Kennedy to, to walk us through anything I'd like to have. Thank you. So, yes, the uh, committee uh, went through the entire uh, uh, transportation CIP over the course of four work sessions in February and March uh, for the most part recommending concurring with the county executives recommended CIP um, the projects that are listed um, under the committee recommendations section of the packet are the only projects that were where the committee recommended uh, changes to what the county executive recommended um, as um, Councilmember Glass uh, noted um, that uh, most notably includes restoring uh, six projects, uh, Bradley Boulevard improvements, Capitol Crescent Trail Tunnel, Goldsboro Road Bikeway and Sidewalk, Forest Glen Passageway, Tuckerman Lane Sidewalk, and Summit Avenue Extension um, to their previously approved timelines after having been recommended for delay uh, by the county executive. Um, and you know that th the exception to that being uh, well, there, rather, there were there were many projects that were recommended for delay. These were simply the ones that were recommended for delay for fiscal reasons, while others were recommended by the county executive to be delayed for natural reasons related to construction. So that's why these specific ones are called out here. Um, again, Observation Drive uh, extended is uh, the committee did a, a thorough review of this project, had a lengthy discussion um, with the Department of Transportation. Um, and found that the currently proposed timeline is the soonest possible timeline that this project can be advanced at, um, given the, the natural constraints on the ground. Um, the committee also made a minor um, um, adjustment to the bikeway program minor projects project um, to recommend the Brown Street uh, connector alternative for the Washington Grove connector sub-project of this bikeway program minor projects broader umbrella. Um, this uh, recommendation is a follow-up to a, a t and &E committee discussion on the Washington Grove Connector project held back in January, so this is the, the, the follow-up to that. Um, also worth noting uh, that these uh, restorations that the committee recommended, which um, you'll see reflected in the, the chart under fiscal summary, um, in the packet, um, which adds uh, a substantial amount um, to the, uh, within the six year period of this CIP, um, similar to the approach um, on the operating budget, um, all of these projects will be considered, you know, in a broader context in the, in the whole CIP later down through the process. Um, so, uh, you know, we'll encourage council members if, you know, have specific things to say about individual projects here to do so, um, but this will be, again, part of a, a broader effort uh, through through the course of our budget approval through the end of May. I also uh, wanted to, to second this uh, analysis um, that council staff did of, of CIP projects by council district. Um, this was in a, an amendment, a, a revised packet that I, uh, the council staff put up yesterday, so apologies if um, folks, if Council members don't have the updated packet for that, but it's we, we have it for the record, um, and I'm happy to elaborate on that in future t &E or council work sessions. Um, it's they, online. It is on. Yes, yeah, sorry. It is it is online, um, and uh, yeah, it is, it is the currently updated um, packet on on the website. And uh, with that, um, I'll turn it over to. OMB or Department of Transportation staff if they have anything else to add. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Kenny. So, uh, Mr. President, the uh, T&E committee uh, recommends 3-0 uh, that we support all these uh, support this this proposal. Thank you very much. Just want to express my appreciation to the committee, uh, putting my uh, individual council member, district council member hat on a number of the projects that were impacted in the proposed CIP are in District 1 or were formerly in District 1. I uh, <laughs> sent a, a memo and uh, appreciate the the committee's thoughtfulness in, in going through these issues, understanding that there are tough decisions ahead, as there always are, but uh, there was an interest in trying to mitigate some of the uh, impacts uh, uh, to many of these projects, and I very much appreciate uh, that work, and I really in particular appreciate the focus on safety, on accessibility, and on multimodal uh, uh, improvements and, and on our con continuing our Vision Zero priorities. So thank you to the to the committee for your work. Let me turn it over. Speaking of the committee, to Councilmember Balcom. Um, sure. Thank you. I want to um, thank Mr. Kenny and uh, staff as and DOT as well for for the discussion. Um, I'm just seeing the the CIP projects by council district. Not for nothing, but District 2 is the tiniest one in there, um, but but there are reasons for that. I do just want to briefly talk about Observation Drive. Um, you know, it's, it, it's just not in my nature to support a delay on a road project in my district, so I just wanted to mention it. Um, so there's two phases to Observation Drive. Um, and both are being delayed for, for important reasons. One is we have a current um, sector plan, the gate, uh, Clarksburg Gateway Sector Plan, uh, and this uh, phase two of this project uh, goes right through it. And it, it, I would assume that the, uh, the route is going to change for very important reasons. Um, it, it makes um, sense for that route to change on phase two. Um, and we won't know that until the master plan is completed. So that, that makes sense. Phase one, uh, of course, when we build a road, phase one's got to meet, meet phase two in the right spot. Um, but also there's a, uh, there's a property that's currently um, uh, looking at uh, redevelopment, not redevelopment, development. It's a greenfield site. And so it just makes sense. Uh, the community's been waiting this, for this road for a very, very long time, um, but it makes sense to have the right road in the right place uh, when that happens. Uh, although um, I would hope that this road is built in the next six years, uh, but I understand uh, the delay and um, I just want to put a marker down for if the decisions are made within the year, that we look at it next year, but m most likely we'll look at it again uh, when the CIP opens in two years' time. This is a very important road. It needs to be built. Uh, it just needs to be built in the right spot. So thank you. Thank you. Council Member Katz. Thank you very much, and the thank you committee here. Uh, I want to thank the committee and uh, Mr. Kenny for all their help. I just wanted to quickly note that finally the Washington Grove <laughs> Connector program, which I always say has been on a on a fast track. It's only been 18 years that they've been working on that. But the the committee did come back with um, the uh, preferred alignment that Washington Grove wants for the Brown Street. And I want to publicly thank Mr. Conklin and and others who worked on this to finally get it to the be back on track. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor Drawanda. Thank you. Also, thanks to the committee. Obviously, uh, as I think the T&E chair said when we presented the education and culture CIP last week, uh, these are rec we're going to have to reconcile all this and, and figure it out. There's obviously not enough to do it all, um, but uh, uh, and obviously relates to some of the conversations we were just having as, uh, earlier this morning as well. Um, I just wanted to make sure I was clear. So the executive had delayed. Bradley Boulevard, Capitol Crescent, Goldsboro, Forest Glen, Tuckerman, Observation, and Summit. And the committee restored Bull Bradley, Capitol Crescent, Goldsboro, Forest Glen, Tuckerman, and Summit. So which observation is the only one that was not restored? That's Just right. to be correct. Okay, got it. And the total amount of those restorations over the six years is what? So you can see that uh, total amount of restoration reflected in the difference on that on the table on the first uh, page between the FY25 to 30 CE recommended and the committee recommended. Um, and you'll also see that difference reflected in the 
uh, beyond six years. Um, so basically moving... Do you mind just saying the number? I, I don't have that number on hand. I can find that. Okay, yeah, I just I just like to, you know, we'll, we'll go over this again. I just wanted people to understand the, the gravity of this, you know, these decisions that it is. So you're saying on that chart, this committee change from FY23 approved. I'm sorry, committee change... The, so the the one second from the bottom would be the the changes if we added it up, right? Starting in twenty five through twenty eight. Oh yes, apologies. I we do I, I do have that number here. Yes, that'd be. Um, well, no, that's sorry. That's the change from the twenty five to twenty three to twenty eight approved. Um, the the change. I'm just trying to do the math. I, I'm trying. To, Apologies. That's uh, the change um, between the CE recommended and the committee recommended is uh, roughly one hundred seventy two point five million. Got it. Thank you. Over right. the six years. Over the six years. Got That's it. right. Okay. Obviously. All right. Um, appreciate the committee and appreciate just don't want to point that out. We're going to have to make some difficult decisions, but I appreciate it. Thank you. Councilmember Fonda Gonzalez. I would like to start by thanking the committee once again for all their work, and thank you so much for putting the Forest Glen passage, passageway uh, back. Um, very important project in my district, and for folks living in, in Forest Glen, uh, ensuring that people can walk and bike in a safe manner. Uh, I also would like to highlight the, Mill, the BRT on Verosmill Road. As you all know, we have another death happening in our community. Just a couple of days ago, another pedestrian crossing Verosmill Road. This is urgent. We're talking about people dying just because they're crossing the street, and I cannot wait to get this done. And I know DOT, you know, feels me <laughs> when I, I say this. It's not me criticizing you at all. I know these things take a lot of time. It's just they're not fast enough for me when people continue to die, literally. Um, so I wanted to uplift that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Stewart. Great. I just want to say uh, thank you to my colleagues on the committee and Mr. Kenny for your uh, first CIP budget. Um, as we're always looking in the future to improve upon things, um, I would ask, um, in addition, in the future to the breakdown by um, district of projects, that we also look at our equity emphasis areas. Um, so, thank you. Heard. Appreciate it, Councilor Lukey. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I thank you for um, the work in the committee on this, and I appreciate certainly you know that there are a lot of challenges um, in managing all this. But I also really appreciate that we're going to keep these alive to discuss and work through. And um, you know certainly to Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez's point, it might not be in my district, but I'm very aware of that problem and very aware of the consequences in terms of overall safety that are presented by that. So, um, and and I want to thank uh, all of you for the work you do on the projects that are that are in District Seven. I know we have a, a significant number of them, and and that many of them came with state funding to help move these along um and so it it wasn't clear to me are the state are the funds marked out in the capital budget book for us that show how much state funding is going into each of these projects do you because these, these we don't were reflect through. they haven't been trued up with any actions in this legislative session they reflect the pre-authorizations from last year from last year's um, okay and I think for many of the projects you're interested in, those came through as expected yes. this year. But it, we haven't gone back through to double check right. whether the state actions correspond to what's right. in this document. Because timing, ha you know, you have to print the books when you have to print the books. But right. um, but I did I did want to make that clear that uh, there there is a significant investment from the state in the projects in my district, and I am grateful to our state team for bringing that money back to help facilitate these and keep these on track. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Councilmember Sales. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, and thank you to the members of the T&E committee um, and Mr. Kenny for analyzing the packet. Um, you know, as an at-large member, it's pretty hard to prioritize which uh, projects should be funded. Um, but given the walk that we all participated in, most of us, I believe, um, along Georgia Avenue, 
um, and the impacts to the Vision Zero funding. Um, I know that this area has some of the highest pedestrian fatalities in the county um, and the need to continue the investments uh, for BRT, uh, which makes our multimodal transportation options more efficient. Um, I will support um, the recommendations and um, look forward to continuing these discussions. Um, just want to make sure that, you know, I'm looking at the spending across um, the districts and um, don't know how we can apply equity across the districts, but given how we're ranking, what's a priority, um, it's going to be difficult, but it would be helpful. I know um, some of these districts have been historically underfunded. Um, and then you think about the needs of the districts. Um, so I just want to ensure that we are um, taking these factors into account as we're making these decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Mink. Thank you. I want to thank the TE committee for their work on this. Um, just highlight a couple of things. Um, appreciate the restoration of some of these key projects, including the Forest Glen passageway, uh, which uh, impacts a number of my constituents as well. Um, the I want to take the opportunity to ask uh, DOT a couple questions um, on road maintenance. Uh, it's important, really helpful for each district office to have a list of all the planned work um, for the district, like broken down by type. And I understand this was something that uh, was done a number of administrations ago, uh, but then stopped being done. And um, I, I raised this in an operating budget memo to, with t &E last year as well. And my understanding that was that those were to resume this year or hopefully sometime soon. So I just wanted to check in on when those lists could be made available. Uh, I, I don't know precisely when, but after budget action, we can certainly provide Great. updates. And I think the spring season paving in this fiscal year has already been announced. Yeah. Um, so yeah. We're, we're working to re reinstate those updates for the different paving and concrete maintenance programs. Great. Appreciate it. Yeah, the, I, this is one that I'm sure uh, I'm not alone as a district council member and getting lots and lots of questions about road maintenance. Um, this is an area where we are like nowhere even remotely near the amount of funding uh, that we would need to be able to keep up uh, in an ideal way with with our roads. And I know that uh, DOT, um, you know, that you're doing your darndest. And so then it comes down to communication. And we definitely want to be able to help facilitate that transparency as much as possible from the council side as well. Appreciate that. Um, let's see. I wanted to also highlight a, a joint memo that came from three really active uh, citizen groups in, uh, in East County, uh, the Greater Colesville Citizens Association, uh, the LabQuest Community Association, and the Tamarack Triangle Civic Association. Um, they were suggesting a, a project addition to the CIP for a study of alternatives for providing BRT along Randolph from 355 to 29. Um, which that's already master plan, um, but uh, it would be, be great to get a response, a formal response from DOT. Obviously, we're in the middle of crunch time right now, uh, but um, they highlighted some very thoughtful changes there. Uh, scope expansion to provide BRT east of 29 to the Life Science Activity Center, for example. So um, is that something that you all have had a chance to look at, uh, or should we follow up after, and or we'll follow well, we up can, after? We can provide certainly a detailed response. We did Great. know of this request, and we did not start any new BRT planning right. projects in the CIP. We have a, a very substantial unmet need for the projects that are Absolutely. already in design. So that, that's the basics of it. We also identified that the North Bethesda Transit Way and the Randolph Road Transit Way are closely linked in their utility. So if you if the North Bethesda project moves forward in some way, which is not recommended in the CIP at this time, it would make sense to integrate that with the planning for that Randolph Road project, which goes across county. I would note that a lot of the recommendations related to the road network in the White Oak area are sort of beyond what we would implement because they're not reflected in the master plans for mm -hmm. that area. Doesn't mean they're bad ideas, but there's probably a broader set of work activities for multiple agencies that would be necessary if those sorts of improvements were to be entertained. Great, appreciate it. And um, and then street lighting. So this is another area where uh, the recommended budget, the budget that's available, is far short of the kind of optimal budget, um, like like with road maintenance. 
Um, so wanted to highlight that one as well. We have, this is another one that we hear a lot about, and I'm sure I'm not the only district council member. Um, so another area that it would be great to, if there are places where we can restore or go above the recommended funding, as with road maintenance, this is one uh, on behalf of my constituents that I would look at as well. Um, we have especially communities along 29 and connecting uh, secondary streets uh, that continue to raise concerns about inadequate street lighting. Um, so, you know, obviously the budget is very tight in these areas. It has been historically uh, important to maximize the resources where we can and make the most of what's available. So in that vein, also wanted to um, highlight the possibility of looking at um, pursuing the purchase of street lighting that's presently owned by PEPCO uh, to give us a quicker path to LED, um, reduce the need for coordination between the county and utilities, and uh, expedite some, some new installations and maintenance work. Uh, I'm sure that's something that you have looked at to some extent, but we we'll look forward to continuing the conversation on that. Um, and uh, lastly, on the uh, US 29 BRT, um, so with a, with a one-year delay uh, to the planning and design work, um, what is the anticipated outreach schedule for DRT, um, reaching out to all the stakeholders, including those closest to the project area? I don't have the specific in schedule in front of me. I know we had an internal briefing yesterday on mm -hmm. how the design work is progressing, and we did talk about the next phase of public outreach, so it's relatively soon, but I can get you the specific dates. Great. Thanks so much. I yield. Thank you. Councilor Glass. Thank you. Appreciate uh, all the comments uh, and questions from, from colleagues and, and picking up on, on Councilmember Mink's questions about BRT, recognizing there is a huge network we aspire to build, but we have to build other parts first, right? Uh, I will reiterate my ongoing uh, frustration with the pace of Route 29, the first line, and that is an ongoing conversation. But uh, for the purposes of, of this discussion, uh, Director Conklin, can you just share with the council uh, the the different parts of the BRT, uh, the section, the phase, the phasing of it, because I think it's important uh, for us to just get the baseline, uh, because it is, I think, the single largest aspect of the CIP. Sure, I'm happy to do that. There are two projects that are in the design process. The Veers Mill project is actually close to wrapping up the design. The CIP in front of you, which we anticipate an amendment that makes some minor revisions to that funds the construction of that project. We are involved in the federal review process to receive a small starts grant for that, and that process is taking a little bit more time than we would like. Um, but nonetheless, we are looking to have a fully funded project for construction on Veers Mill Road that would start construction in some minor ways in the upcoming fiscal year, but then in FY 26-27, uh, more substantial construction. The next project that is in design is the entirety of the Maryland 355 project from Clarksburg to Bethesda. Um, we are advancing the design of that. We have a design, progressive design build procurement that we are working on that will take the design at the quote 65% level or more, you know, roughly two thirds complete level that we're currently at and, and finish that design with a selected design and construction firm that will allow us to implement the extent of that project that we have adequate resources to do that. We are also involved with the Federal Transit Administration on a new starts application for that. It's about a year behind where we are with Veers Mill Road, but that application would focus on the segment between Rock, uh, Montgomery College Rockville, which is where the Veers Mill Corridor ends, and Montgomery College Germantown or Germantown Transit Center uh, in the north. So you would have a continuous <coughs> BRT network at the conclusion of that project from Germantown to Wheaton. The next segment that's in design is 355 north of Germantown to Clarksburg and 355 south of Montgomery College Rockville to Bethesda. The scale of those projects is radically different. The north component is maybe a $100 million investment. The south is more like a $400 million investment. So we don't currently have the financial capacity identified to do the construction element of that project. In the planning process, we have two other projects. We have the North Bethesda Transitway, which is Westfield Montgomery Mall, to the North Bethesda Metro Station. That process will be wrapping up late this fiscal year, early next fiscal year. On the same time frame as the New Hampshire Avenue project between Colesville and the Fort Totten Metro Station, that planning process will also be wrapping up late this fiscal year, early next fiscal year. 
Again, we don't yet have the fiscal capacity for construction of those projects identified, but we didn't have fiscal capacity for any of these projects identified when we started them. So we think they will follow a similar trajectory of identifying outside funding, county funding, and federal funding to make them realities. And you mentioned the US 29 project. That project has been in service since 2020. Um, we have two activities going on to add to that. One is design of dedicated lanes, and that design has progressed through all of the field work stages and the uh, concept plans are being developed now. And that's a dedicated lane between Sligo Creek Parkway, roughly, and Tech Road at the northern end of that corridor. So that will continue to advance. And Council Member Mink asked about the public engagement. That public engagement activity will resume as that project is making progress again. And then the second component of enhancement on US 29 is the extension of the service um, from Burtonsville to, um, to Maple Lawn, the Applied Physics Laboratory, and Columbia in Howard County. And we are exchanging drafts of a memo U uh, where Howard County would pay for the operation of that service extension, and the fleet component of that is covered by an earmark we received last year. So there's a lot of activity here. It's it does move slower than we all would like, but these are some of the most complex projects we've done as a department. And the integration with the federal requirements and getting federal approvals for these grants is a, is a very intensive application that runs on the time frame of those agencies rather than the time frames we would like. So um, that's where we are generally with the BRT program. And I should mention, not in the BRT program, but the Great Seneca Transit Network is actively in construction now at almost all of the station sites and we do plan to launch that service this fall. Great, thank you. Uh, appreciate you laying out that roadmap, uh, particularly you know, with regard to New Hampshire, which is of interest to a number of colleagues as well down the pipeline. And, and with regard to community engagement, particularly on 29, I, I know that Councilmember Mink and I specifically uh, get community engagement every time we walk out of our homes uh, on, on that particular segment. So uh, we'll, we'll happily share the, the thoughts of our, our neighbors. But uh, again, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kenny. Thank you uh, to DOT for, for this work. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We have a committee recommendation. We'll take a straw vote. All those in favor of the committee recommendation, please indicate by raising your hand. That is unanimous. We will move on to our next item. Uh, this is conservation of natural resources, agricultural land preservation. The Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee took this up. Uh, ultimately uh, approved as submitted. It's a fairly straightforward item. I will say there's been a lot of work leading up to this uh, in the Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee from last year and really from the Planning, Housing, and Economic Development Committee previous to that in trying to uh, clean up this CIP item and make sure that uh, it wasn't being used to offset operating expenses. Uh, and to really focus it on its original intent. There were decisions that were made for fiscal reasons in the depths of the Great Recession many years ago uh, that had just continued, and the previous Fed committee had uh, focused on that for a couple of years, sent uh, uh, actually two memos to the county executive, and ultimately uh, we've gotten to a place where we have a clean item that only focuses on uh, the purpose of these fund agricultural land preservations largely through easement. The CIP totals $23,873,000. It was approved as submitted. I'll turn it over to Mr. Ali if he has anything to add to that, and then we can turn it over to Mr. Scheffel and our uh, guests from the Office of Agriculture if they have anything to add. Uh, thank you, Mr. Council President. No, I think you succinctly summarized uh, everything. It's, as you mentioned, this is a CIP item with dedicated revenues, and so the change in expenditures just reflects the change in projection to those revenues, which includes the agricultural transfer tax um, and developer contributions for purchasing BLTs uh, under the option method of de optional method of development in the CR and LSC zones. And for more information, I'll turn it over to the Office of Agriculture. Thank you, everybody. Mike Sheffel, Office of Agriculture, for the record. Um, thank you, Council President. Thank you, below OMB staff. We tried to make this as easy for everybody as possible. The previous conversations showed the level of detail that other departments have to deal with. But I feel like this is very straightforward. And as you indicated, Council President, we got the non-ag preservation costs out. Thank you. So I think we have a good um, budget in front of us that we're, uh, the new Ag Land Preservation Administrator is going to put to good use. 
So I think we're, we're set up for success in preserving the farmland in Montgomery County. Thank you and welcome. Uh, with that, we have a committee recommendation. All those in favor of the committee recommendation, please indicate by raising your hand. That is unanimous. We will move on to legislative session day number nine. Uh, this is the introduction of Bill 924, Group Chief Pension, Social Security Integration. The lead sponsor is Council President at the request of the County Executive. A public hearing will be scheduled at a later date. Ms. Wellens, anything to share about this bill that the County Executive has requested introduction on? Uh, thank you, Mr. Council President. Um, this bill would implement uh, provisions of a collective bargaining agreement that's been newly negotiated between uh, the firefighters IAFF and uh, the executive and it will be considered by the GO committee in the con on um, April 19th in the co context of the discussion about compensation overall. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, I don't see any colleagues wishing to speak. The bill is now introduced. Item five is the consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Moved by uh, Councilmember Katz, seconded by Councilmember Sales. All those in favor of the consent agenda, please raise your hand. That is unanimous. The council is going to go into recess and meet uh, at 12.15 with the Montgomery County Retired Employees Association in the Capitol Crescent Trail Conference Room on the fourth floor. After that, we will reconvene here at 1.15 for a proclamation recognizing Autism Acceptance Month by Councilmember Jawando. Uh, and with that, colleagues, thank you for a very productive morning, and we're now in recess. <laughs>